That is, to confirm the accuracy of the minutes, together with the appendix attached of the Council meeting held on the 29th of July 2020. And if agreed, I will subsequently sign the minutes as a correct record. Now, I have read the minutes and I'm not aware of... Sorry, I was, I was being, we were being asked a question off, off camera. Um, I'm not aware of anybody saying anything contrary to those minutes, so I would look to see if somebody will propose they are taken as read. Chairman, I, I'm happy to take, propose that those are taken as read. David Fothergill, leader. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. I second them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne Brown. Um, so we'll now move then for the information, the chair's announcements. This will, this will be very, very short because it, it covers information regarding the civic events between August and November 2020. Um, I'd particularly like to thank um, the support I've had from Somerset County Council staff in enabling me to attend very restricted and very um, uh, well-distanced uh, poppy uh, um, commemoration ceremonies, of which I've attended at Axbridge, at Cheddar, at Ta uh, Taunton Railway Station, where I put on a wreath last Thursday to go to Paddington, and also together with the, the leader of Council, Councillor David Fothergill, and the Chief Exec Executive Pat Farty, we uh, celebrated the two-minute silence outside County Hall. <coughs> I would also like to thank um i'm trying to sorry i've forgotten her name um uh, the, one of the the members of the opposition who very kindly put our wreath on their cenotaph at taunton last week hazel prior sankey and uh, i'm grateful for her stepping in at the last minute while i was tied up on other matters we also uh, have the honor of attending at the uh care home at Cheddar, the courthouse care home. And these are the people that bravely locked themselves in at the start of the pandemic lock lockdown number one. They left their families behind and looked after their residents and stayed there 
24 hours, seven days a week for nearly three months. And I think that was outstanding. So I had a great pleasure of awarding them a chairman's shield on your behalf, thanking them for what they've done uh, for their public spirited natures. And uh, I think that was well received. And it was a bit of publicity in the Mendip Times. That really concludes the announcements that I've got to make. But it brings me on to a sad announcement. And this relates to Julie Stevens, who was a team leader, a family time uh, server in children's social care, and she died unexpectedly on the 30th of September of this year. Julie worked for Somerset County Council for over 30 years, based in the Mendip area. Julie, during her career with Somerset, had many varied and different roles. Initially, starting work as the receptionist in what was known at that time as the Glastonbury Area Office, Julie went on to become a member of the business support team working alongside children and social workers, moving on to become a family su support worker. It is here that Julie developed her ambition to become a social worker. She was sponsored by Somerset County Council to become a qualified social worker, studying at Bristol and qualifying in 2005. Julie enjoyed working with complex situations. She, very early on in her career, demonstrated those core social work skills of tenacity and curiosity, which she described as Sherlocking. She liked to investigate and solve problems. Julia excelled in court work, becoming a very well-respected childcare social worker whose evidence could be relied upon, or was given in a calm and confident manner which remained steadfast under cross-examination. Julie came from a stance of getting it right for children, and that commitment and passion came over strongly in the court process. Julie's passion for improving children's lives led to her developing the family time service, ensuring that children in care met up with their family in a warm and interesting place where they felt safe. Initially, playing a role in the development of the Willows in Wells, which became the first family time centre Julie oversaw this model and rolled it out across the county and became the county team leader for the family time service. Julie was rightly proud of this achievement. In this final role with children's social care, Julie was proud of what she and her team had developed and to her credit, her ambition will live on in the teams that she created and developed. Julie had an amazing energy, an incredible work ethic, and always had children at the centre of what she did. She was a force of nature, and she touched many lives. If there was ever a recipe for what outstanding social work is, then Julie would be the main ingredient. Julie is sadly missed by her family and colleagues, to whom I extend my personal condolences and I do so on behalf of all of you councillors. Thank you. I now move to item five, which is the pu public question time. Now, I'm going to be inviting all speakers registered to address the council and highlight there will be a 15 second delay before speakers address the meeting. Each speaker will be reminded they have up to three minutes to make any key points and to try and not repeat points made by other speakers on the same matter. I will be very firm on this three minutes because the amount of business that we have to transact today, so I will not be assisting uh, with any requests to grant any extensions, I'm sorry. I will highlight that every member has access to the statements and questions that are being submitted, and therefore speakers may wish to summarise their key points and focus their available time to put their questions to the Council. You will find these questions in Annex A to this schedule. And members are reminded that there will be no public debate on these public questions. I'm going to invite public speakers in the following order. The first will be Susanna Clements uh, speaking on road safety. Susanna Clements, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. So I'm addressing the climate emergency, mental and physical health emergencies, and the imminent employment emergency. Our historic main roads between towns are scenic, level and direct. Originally created by walkers and drovers, they're now virtually inaccessible to anyone not travelling at speed in a motor vehicle. I believe it's for the council to make it possible, easy and above all normal to, to commute between towns and villages without a car using active travel like cycling, walking, skating, running, mobility scooters, push chairs, wheelchairs, bicycle trailers, electric bikes and so forth. And above all, make these paths run alongside the road so that they're visible and appealing to the people driving. So those two attempted to cycle or walk next time they commute, and especially bearing in mind the price of electric cars, which we'll all have to be using. To this end, it'd be reasonable to think about devoting a third of highways funding in addition to any specific government grants to laying and maintaining permanent pathways running alongside the direct main roads. And my question is, what is the council's aspiration for the proportion of car journeys switching to active transport in the next 20 years? A bit of background, Somerset has a network of ancient and wonderful ridgeways and level, straight level droves created by travellers on foot. Most of these direct and efficient routes are now unusable except by car due to being entirely taken over by fast heavy motor vehicles. They've become the A-roads. Leisure cycle routes go a really long way round, they're ill-maintained and there are many gaps and intervals along dangerous high roads, so they're no good for young people, for children or old people. So now we want and we urgently need to get out of our cars, to cycle, walk, use mobility scooters, and we can't, whether to get One to work, left. to or from school, to visit relatives or for medical services, or to go shopping, or to catch a bus or a train even, we have to get in a car, even when it's nearby, even to reach a bus stop. So we're campaigning in Glastonbury to lower the motor traffic, to make it easier for us all to move around town without resorting to cars. This campaign will be completely ineffectual as long as people can't get out beyond the town to streets, Bridgewater, villages such as Mere, which, are on, which is on route to Burnham and Cheddar, to Wells, to Pilton and Shepton Mallet. All these places are within easy commuting cycling distance, yet none of them is linked to Glastonbury by a safe direct path wide enough to accommodate cyclists and walkers. Thank you. Thank you, my lady. Well within time. I'm going to now ask Councillor John Woodman, portfolio holder for highways, to respond. Councillor Woodman. Can you see me, Chairman? Yes, you can. I can, yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan, for that very interesting question. Uh, reducing Somerset's carbon emissions in the transport sector will be absolutely key to achieving our stated goal of carbon neutrality within the county. We have not set any targets regarding the proportion of journeys switching to active travel. However, active travel solution will play an important part in our ability to drive down carbon emissions, particularly for shorter journeys. We also look at facilitate other forms of behavioural change to enable reduction in the county's overall emissions, including reducing the number of single occupant journeys, uh, encouraging more people to use public transport and enabling alternative fuels, which will be key to decarbonising long distance journeys where other transport options are not viable. The government gives us a highway grant to keep our roads, footpaths and cycleways in a good state and safe for public use. If we do not spend this money on maintenance of our, um, we do not spend this money on maintenance, the repair costs will spiral out of control. There are currently not many government grants for sustainable and active travel transport in rural areas, but you will be pleased to learn that the government looks like it is changing its support and it is putting in place firmer guidelines and specific funds for pedestrian and cycling schemes. We need to bid for funding and we don't yet know the rules, uh, uh, what the rules will be to access any funds, but we are looking forward to that opportunity to bid for them. 
Um, we have noted the grant support for the majority of the public for the emergency travel transport arrangements put in place to enable COVID secure shopping in our high streets over the recent months. And now we have secured a further £450,000 of government funding for such measures so we can expand this type of provision subject to agreement with our district council colleges, college, uh, colleagues and also reflecting the views of our business community. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Woodman. I'm going to move, move to the second questioner, David Redwell. He will be talking on COVID-19 transport. David Redwell, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I'd like to raise a few points. First of all, obviously, always put on record the help and support from the officers of Somerset County Council on keeping the transport system moving in the county, and particularly the bus and rail inf infrastructure. Um, but I want to raise a few serious points, and that is at the last uh, council meeting, both myself and colleagues raised the issue of Froome. And um, we are disappointed to learn that there are still COVID non-secure bus shelters uh, with uh, all sorts of things that shouldn't be there, uh, ranging from uh, bags of dog poo to needles. And I would ask the Director of Public Health to remind the Council in Froome that they have a duty under COVID-19 regulations and also under the guidance from the Department of Transport uh, to make sure that bus infrastructure is kept clean, safe and efficient for uh, the residents of, of Somerset. I put on record my thanks to Mendix Council for the cleaning works at the bus stations and infrastructure in Mendix, although I understand some of it in Froome is not owned by Mendix Council. So I just raised that and asked if that's dealt with them urgently. In um, uh, Taunton Town Centre, uh, we've been working with first with Alex Carter to this group to make sure that there is social distancing. We've picked up various buses that are, would be leaving uh, passengers behind, particularly the 25 route to Dolverton uh, and the issue of the students. But we do need more support from uh, PCSOs and from uh, council officials and SWAT to make sure that social distancing of bus stilts and passengers can board. Uh, first is providing duplicate buses on many routes to Minehead to Bridgewater and Wellington, um, but we do need to make, to make sure that centre of all is safe. On park and ride, we are very supportive of park and ride. We are not supportive as an organisation for any car park on the old bus station site. Certainly, we think it will undermine park and ride, uh, deal with the climate change emergency and give the wrong signals to the people of summer that you can drive into the town centre when we're supposed to be adding more sustainable travel. Um, on, on the centres of Yeovil, Bridgewater and Glastonbury, I make a request to join the consultation with the police and the county council and the districts that we get proper um, addressing of where the bus services need to be if these have become long-term measures. Certainly we'd welcome conversations with passengers and with the bus operators. On rail, we welcome the grant for the West Somerset Railway um, and, the, and the money that's come available there. Um, we'd also, if it had been in real normal times, we'd have been insisting that SWAT go and have a look at, at councillors, we were on the bus working party, go and have a look at bus interchanges at uh, Exeter being funded by the South West Transport Board, or to go to Gloucester and see the brand new interchange that's being funded by the Government Direct. We believe very fully that there should be new bus facilities for passengers in Taunton, and we are aware there is public money available from the Department for Transport uh, that could be bid for by the County Council, but not Ten SWAT. seconds, David, ten seconds. Okay. Finally, I think we've come to the conclusion that unitary Somerset or unitary uh, Somerset will be the best way forward, bringing planning, transport and all the facilities into one umbrella. And thank you, Mr. Redwell. Thank you very much for that. I'm afraid you're out of time, sir. But yeah. thank you for your contribution. I'm going to now invite uh, Councillor John Woodman and Councillor David Fothergill. I don't know who uh, wishes to John, speak first. John. John, Councillor John Woodman to reply, please, first. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. I'll go first. Thank you, David, for this question and also for your continuing campaigning to improve transport arrangements for the people right across our county. Uh, he does a great job and his views are, are very, very highly regarded. Um, he raises a wide range of questions and observations, some, of course, which relate to the responsibilities of this council and some which don't. Um, and I will briefly set out our response to those questions indicating which relate to the areas of responsi our responsibility and also note the range of observations and ideas for future enhancements to bus and rail services in our county that David has provided. Um, the COVID-19 bus shelter cleaning and social distancing, unlike the 
the, the, the West of England combined authority. Ownership of bus shelters in Somerset lies with either the district, the town or the parish councils, and they are responsible for maintaining and cleaning them. The district councils have advertising contracts, which include cleaning and maintenance. And therefore, in most of our busy town centres, stops in the county should be subject to that regular cleaning regimes. Um, we were right to the districts and the towns and the parish about your concerns that, that you have raised. Um, face covering enforcement on public transport. Again, this is not the council's responsibility. I'm not aware of any enforcement in the wearing of face coverings that has been undertaken by the Avon and the Somerset Police, but will make them aware of the concerns raised. Face coverings on our school and college transport. We are working closely with secondary schools and colleges across Somerset on the wearing of face coverings by students. The fitting of the screens in vehicles is a matter for operators. Where we have received requests for financial assistance for funding these services, um, and supporting the operators, we'll do that through the COVID-19 bus services support count, which is allocated to Somerset County Council. On the proposals to turn Taunton bus station and coach station into a car park, this is a project being developed by Somerset West and Taunton Councils. So we're unable to, to issue directives on the requirements for planning application, but as a consultee, we are keen to see good sustainable transport options. Um, the D2 school transport bus service, Somerset County Council does not fund the D2 service, and we're aware of issues relating to school children on this route, which we understand is being addressed by Baines. We have offered to provide contributions through the allocation of Department of Education funding for additional capacity to provide access to education, but up to this date we have not been asked to assist. The Froome Town Centre Redevelopment, uh, this, is a, this is a town council project here. Um, the facilities at Wells Bus and Coach Station, this facility is owned by Mendip District Council. Um, on your question of the Berries Coach, from London uh, from to London Hammersmith, uh, we posted timetables at several stops where this service um, when this service recommenced after the first lockdown. This is current. This service is currently suspended, but we will check again with various coaches to see if there's any pickup points um, that we need to look at um, when the service comes back online. The service on the first bus route, first bus routes. 172, 173, 174, 126 and 20. The service were provided on a commercial basis by First Bus. And we would expect them to resume once passenger numbers begin to increase. Uh, on the local reorganisation, your reference, you referenced the proposal. I think, I think Oops. I think if I may, I think that's uh, where you hand over to me, John. If you oh, want. right. I haven't got that on my thing. No, nope. sorry, David. OK, well, as, as you heard, um, Councillor David Fothergill, the leader, will now continue. Thank you, Councillor John Woodman, portfolio holder for highways. Councillor Fothergill, please. John, thanks very much indeed for picking up David's uh, questions. And uh, David, nice to nice to see you. And um, it, uh, hopefully we'll soon all be back together where we can actually meet up again and let's talk about these things face to face but thank you for your question um, and I think the answer from John uh, Woodman illustrated in many ways why we actually need to move to a unitary model um, district do this county do that district do that it is a nonsense we need to move on very quickly and I'm pleased that the uh, Secretary of State has now issued the letter which will allow us to do that you do reference the proposals put forward by the district councils uh, and you in your question you mentioned uh, Bath North East Somerset of course North Somerset I would advise you um, that Bath and North East Somerset took a vote of their council last week and roundly rejected uh, any involvement in any reorganization in the Somerset area 
uh, and North Somerset have also indicated and neither I believe have submitted their business case or a business case as part of the uh, 9th of November deadline. Our own proposal, one Somerset, I believe, uh, and I, I, I feel that I've got a lot of support on this, will give much more weight to local views uh, in all areas, but particularly the Mendip areas, and place power where it should actually be at the very heart of our local communities. But thank you for your question, David. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. I'm now going to move to the third uh, questioner, Mr. <coughs> David Orr, and he will speak on travel plans. Mr. David Orr, please. Hello, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Mr. Orr. Thank you. Right, here we go. Councillor John Woodman has submitted a generally positive review of the ECI service. However, I have evidence concerns about a lack of oversight of some Section 106 agreements and many travel plans. I welcome the undertaking in Section 2.1 to improve the way planning applications are considered and processed between the planning authorities and the county council as a highway authority. During a recent parking review undertaken for the Richard Huish College area, where student on-street parking is the principal issue, the parking manager decided to utilise a residence petition urging the college to take responsibility for the student parking problems. The petition count was added into consultation terms that were inadequate on their own to justify charge parking schemes. Richard Hewish College had no active travel plan despite a planning condition requiring one as long as new teaching blocks were occupied. The parking manager saw no issue with allowing the college to take no part in a parking review for their own student parking problems in an area named after the college. Despite this council's claim to support the injury council, I was left playing two-tier council bingo between the local planning authority and SEC as the travel plan authority. ECI stated the requirement for an active travel plan by the college had been discharged, but on further legal advice, it was shown that viewpoint was wrong, so the college does need a current travel plan. ECI maintains a web-based travel plan system whereby monitoring records submitted by the developer are made. For Rich Jewish College, the original travel plan 2011-16 to had no ECI monitoring records. I then checked the travel plan for the Killers Park development in the tour of the South Division. Again, there were no monitoring records showing, and repeated requests to ECI for them have been ignored for weeks. On completion of travel plans, ECI does not review them to see how effective they were in reducing car journeys and shifting people to walking, cycling and busing. This lack of a review of completed travel plans to assess their effectiveness is, in my view, very policy and common sense. We are here today debating climate change, yet it appears that travel plans are not managed and resourced effectively by ECI. I ask that the Audit Committee now place travel plans onto the swap audit schedule to ensure that the policy is fit for purpose and that travel plans are effectively managed for compliance by developers. I found out in 2016 that a key Section 106 condition for Killers Park to have a travel plan had been overlooked by ECI. I asked the ECI many weeks back for a simple report on the current Section 106 agreement status for Killers Park. In October 2016, swap auditors investigated the Section 106 monitoring in ECI and in a partial opinion concluded that the current system relies upon the honesty of the developers. ECI management then gave commitments that a cost of new IT system would be implemented by March 2017 with updated processes to address the many failings found in the audit. Why now can't ECI simply print me a progress report on the Killens Park Section 106 status? Should swap auditors review the Section 106 oversight system again. Would ECI also commit to web publishing Section 106 status by planning commission area so that councillors, town and parish councils and engaged citizens can track progress and assist in Section 106 compliance? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Orr. Thank you. Um, I will ask uh, Councillor Woodman to respond, please. Um, well, thank you very much for that highly complicated set of questions. David, um, I'm aware that you have received full responses from the officer on both these travel plan issues, which have been raised previously in correspondence. Richard Hewis College has discharged its planning condition to prepare a travel plan, and we continue to work with them to encourage as wide a range of sustainable tra travel options as possible. The outstanding monitoring data from the CLUM site is now being uploaded to our monitoring system by the developer. As I'm sure you're aware, SWAP undertook a follow-up audit 
on the management of the 106 agreements during 2018-2019. Swap were assured that that <coughs> there were both an auditable system and a set of management processes in place associated with those 106 agreements. These systems and processes still remain in place today. Um, your request to the Southwest Audit Partnership is noted. You should know that SWAP have reduced their work considerably in order to redeploy their staff to support Council's effort to control and combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I would like to uh, thank them publicly for this approach, which has helped enormously at this as time of most need. Thank you, Councillor Woodman. I'm now going to move to uh, the fourth questioner, Eva, I always apologise when I pronounce her name, Brychowski. And she will speak on central government funding. Eva Brychowski, please. Uh, can, can you hear me, Chair? I can, my lady. Yes, I can. Could you do me a favour and tell me when it's halfway through, uh, when I, it's a minute and a I half? Will. I'll, I'll give you a minute and a half's notice. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, my statement wasn't published and my questions, I think, don't really make sense without the statement. Um, since 2010, local authorities in England have had the money received from central government um, cut by nearly half as part of uh, a central government's austerity measures. The eligib eligibility uh, criteria gets stricter and stricter. I believe it's 23,000 now if they've got over that in savings. Uh, people uh, have saved up uh, those um, and they've had a dream that they'd be able to pass their um, house on to their children. Uh, this has destroyed their dream. Um, it had a knock-on effect in Somerset. I mean, what Mel Locke has been doing is laudable, you know, trying to keep people independent in their own homes. Um, but then some people, when they fall or they, they can't do it anymore, um, there needs to be more places and, you know, in care homes. Um, why so, uh, local authorities should start to behave more like trade unions is a bit odd, but I think it's a good idea. It's because trade unions have, have been very successful. Now, I'm not saying go on strike or anything like that, um, but, you know, there have been successes like um, uh, uh, high wages, improved working conditions, health and safety. A minute uh, and a half to go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so. I feel that the um, Somerset Local Authority, as members of the Local um, Government Association, should uh, engage in a variety of actions that are attention-grabbing and likely to attract um, lots of media attention. Um, a, a, the big problem with, with social care is market fragility. Care providers are going out of business um, and, the, uh, and so on, and there's disjointed care and a post lottery. Um, regarding oh, what man, um, Matt Hancock said, he's leaving it all to local authorities to decide what policies, which gives managers, it gives a, he's not taking responsibility, so it leaves managers uh, dealing with um, liability and insurance. Local authorities have to pay... 30 seconds. Oh, thank you so much. So my questions... Um, I'm, I'm just going to go on to, to question three, to be honest. Um, you know, turning problems into opportunities, clarifying what um, Somerset wants to achieve, stating when the above will happen, who's going to oversee it, uh, and what are the checkpoints and criteria um, as to uh, whether this has been achieved. Uh, and I know it... Yes, Chair? Thank you. You have had your time, but I will exceptionally, and I said I wouldn't at the start, I'll give you a further 30 seconds because you, you, you're making the comment that you felt something wasn't published. So you have another 30 seconds starting now. Thank you. So, um, as I say, um, there might be doubt in, in councillors' minds that, it, you know, but then, um, as Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or can't, you're right. And I think 
you know, the government isn't listening. The government isn't going to provide adequate funding. So you need to act. You need to do something different because it hasn't worked over the years that the LGA have tried to get the funding. So do something different, councillors, um, you know, in order to serve the people you represent. Thank, Thank you. you, Mrs. Brokowski. Thank you very much indeed for your question. Um, right. I'm going to turn to Councillor Fothergill to respond to you. Uh, thank you for your comments and questions, Eva. I, I've got to say that um, a lot of your comments are, are different to the questions that have been set. So I, I'm going to answer the questions that, that were posed as part of your submission. Um, but if there's anything else within your statement of what you've just said, I will pick up separately and come back to you separately and respond separately. So uh, so I'm now leading on the questions one to three, which you, you previously submitted to the County Council. I'm afraid that the idea that the government is providing any extra funding to this council to carry out non-essential works is a fallacy. Uh, there is no spare fund to be used in the way that you describe in your questions. Instead, this council will set a balanced budget despite the enormous workload and expense that COVID-19 has brought about. I would, however, like to point out a couple of areas where creativity and innovation have brought about improvements to people's lives in our county. Our adult services are rightly hailed nationally as leaders and groundbreakers in the way we work with the NHS and communities in order to target the right support to the right people in the right way. A hugely successful and innovative approach that helps the NHS. It improves outcomes for our residents and actually saves this council money at the same time. We are now embarking on a creative new approach to supporting children with a new family approach that again brings about better outcomes for families and is an exciting plan that has been welcomed by our children's services and community groups alike. And as for the process of setting goals and delivering on them, I'd point out our creative use of uh, AV robots in the classroom, again nationally acknowledged, our award-winning contract centre, which again is in the regional finals, and our new digital transformation programme, which is delivering improvements and developments for the public and staff alike, at a time when they will have a great impact. Thank you for your questions. I will pick up your other points and uh, to provide a written answer for them. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill, Leader of the Council. I am now going to turn to uh, item five, and that is Sigurd Remus. Oh, Sigurd Remus, please. Climate change strategy. Hello, Sigurd Remus. Can you hear us, please? I can see you, sir, but I think you're on mute. You're on mute, Mr. Remus. Mr. Remus, you're on mute, sir. You're on mute. Apologies, Chair. I'm not sure that he was. I, I, I think the speakers no, I, may have been off. He's now he's now um, he's now speaking, but uh, the mute button has disappeared, and he doesn't seem to be able to hear us. Uh, he's acknowledged what I've just said. Unfortunately, Mr. Remus doesn't look as if she, he's going to be able to speak. Yeah. Can I suggest that you move on to the next public question? We'll see if we can make contact Thank with Mr. You. Remus outside. Mr. Remus, I'm being advised that the, my colleagues will come. To you and contact you separately and try and sort you out. We will move on to item six, Nigel Bean. Nigel Bean, please. Climate Thank change. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? I can, Nigel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right. The, the, the first um, question, it, it, it relates to um, Somerset Western Taunton's response to some questions the other week. And that was about how can the council ensure cross-boundary actions don't have an adverse impact? And will there be integrating working with other bodies, except public bodies? And the second relates to procurement, um, because in the doc, one of the documents is that, that's there today um, talks about whether it's necessary in the first place. And I mean, it, in relation to that, that sort of includes green and clean procurement. And in the light of recent um, reports about due diligence, etc. So, but and I've, I've put the responses from um, SWT and just basically. Does Somerset County Council have any additional or contradictory points to the responses from the other council? Um, then the next question, and I'll just run through it, relates to a government commissioned report that said capital gains tax rates could, do, 
could double and save about 14 billion, sorry, create 14 billion pounds um, by cutting exemptions and doubling rates. And the report was commissioned by the Chancellor. And also the County Council Network said a fifth of authorities were confident they, they oh, oh, just a fifth were confident that they could meet their legal duties to set a balanced budget next year. And, and I don't think Somerset is in that um, area, but Somerset is part of the um, county council network. So basically, will SCC and the county council network lobby the government for additional uh, brackets prioritising and allocating resources, e.g. doubling capital gains tax and using the receipts for specifically addressing the climate emergency? And would Somerset County Council support the brand new Robin Hood tax on fossil fuels, corporate fossil fuel corporations to help communities affected by, for instance, droughts, floods, wildfires of the climate emergency? Um, thank you, Chair. And just one final point. I noticed the local government association are asking for councils to submit climate change action plans. And would this council be joining in with that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nigel. Well, within time, I'm going to ask now uh, for Councillor Claire Paul and Councillor Mandy Chilcott to reply. Councillor Paul, do you wish to start? Uh, thank you ever so much, Chair. And um, I'm quite happy to just uh, run through both of Nigel's questions and not worry uh, mm -hmm. Mandy if, if that's yes. amenable to you. But uh, thank you so much, Nigel, for those questions. Uh, within your detail, they're quite wide ranging, so it will be my pleasure to provide a further comprehensive written response to them later for you. In short, you ask about the climate change strategy on our agenda today. I'm sure you'll be as interested as us all as to the progress and hopefully support that this strategy will receive today. It is, however, probably sensible to wait until we've had that discussion discussion before getting into the detail about cross-boundary cooperation and procurement and commissioning items. I believe this strategy is comprehensive, is diverse and has collective support across the Somerset County, not just across the public sector in Somerset. It is a live strategy in that it is flexible and adaptable and so should change be required or advisable then it can be agreed, implemented and delivered. You specifically talk about local councils working together. This is something that has happened very successfully in the past and I know will continue into the future. You highlight commissioning, sorry, commissioning arrangements. The Somerset Waste Partnership is a shining example of how parties can cooperate when it is in all of their best interests. I believe climate change is another area that can, if desired, produce deeper and closer working relationships. And uh, moving on to your question about uh, funding, etc., I'm quite happy to take that, Mandy and Chair. As you know, the Council has consistently lobbied for further funding for our services and our priorities. You will know that this council is already making a significant contribution to the climate change strategy through its one million grants fund to encourage and promote community involvement and ownership of local ideas and solutions towards the climate change emergency. On your wider point about lobbying, there is a debate later in the meeting about lobbying government for further funding. This time around, combating COVID-19. Over the years, the council leader, David Fothergill, has been vocal and on the record many times saying that Somerset deserves further and fairer funding and we were disappointed that the planned government comprehensive spending review did not go ahead as hoped. It's extremely difficult to plan for the future and climate change is very much in our thinking as we look to the future. When we only have a budget for one year, we do, though, have a tremendous record in bidding for extra funding for a range of initiatives. One of the most recent is our success with the cycling and walking proposals, which will help deliver some climate change benefits. This latest announcement is for 577,000 as part of the government's change gear plan and aims to provide alternatives to our cars for shorter journeys. 
But as I say, Nigel, I'm really happy to provide a written response addressing all of your points within your questions. And thank you so much for them. Thank you, Councillor Paul. I'm grateful. We're now going to try and see if we can re-establish uh, contact with Sigurd Ramers, where he will talk on climate change strategy. If we cannot, uh, um, Scott Woodridge, the monitoring officer, will read his statement. So, Mr. Remus, can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, yes. brilliant. Hey. Over, over to you, sir. You have three minutes. Okay, maybe get a bit of feedback here, but uh, I'll give you a bit. So, the development of uh, the climate resilient policy, the climate emergency strategy. Are, are you getting feedback? No, uh, I'm, I'm afraid you're very broken, Mr. Remus. I think the best is, is if we get. Scott Woodridge, the monitoring officer who's independent, he will read your statement. You can hear what is said and then you'll you'll be heard properly. So okay. I think that's what we'll do, sir. Scott Woodridge, please. Thank you, Chair, and hopefully everybody can hear me clearly. Uh, Mr. S Mr. Reamer's statement is as follows, and it relates to the climate change strategy. Uh, towards a climate resilient Somerset, Somerset's climate emergency strategy the County Council and the District Councils are to be commended for having produced such a comprehensive and accessible report. In Section 4, our goals, on pages 96 to 98, the report rightly outlines the role that the Councils themselves have in decarbonising their own operations, estates and assets. Goal 1, to decarbonise local authorities, the wider public sector estates and reduce our carbon footprint. In this section, there are some laudable and important proposals, but I see no reference to the investments that the County Council holds, particularly via its pension scheme, many of which are placed in fossil fuel companies. How is the County Council and the District Councils intending to influence the upcoming review of Council pensions when it comes to phasing out these investments? And that completes the uh, question, Council. Thank you, Mr. Woodridge. Well in time as well. I noted that. Mr. Remus, um, you heard that. Are you happy that that has been read out according to the wording you put in? I see a thumbs up. Thank you, sir. I'm going to ask now Councillor Claire Paul to respond to you, please. Councillor Paul. Thank you so much, Sigurd, for your question. And I'm really sorry you're having slight technical difficulties this morning, but we've all heard it from Scott. I'm afraid the answer has not changed since it was last asked at this full council, though. I'm sure you're aware responsibility for the running of the pension fund has been fully delegated to the pensions committee. There are very good reasons for this, and the pension fund is not the council's money. We're merely custodians of it on behalf of a wide range of stakeholders, and the pensions committee is specifically set up with those representations of all the stakeholders. Pensions are a really complex area and the members of the pension committee themselves undertake training so as to be able to deal with these complexities and also to devote the time to discuss and explore them, which would not be possible sometimes at full council. I thank you for your nod to our climate emergency strategy and the climate emergency and how to respond to to it within the fund's investments is also a complex issue, especially as it's so intertwined with the pooling investments that the fund is obliged to do. The Somerset Fund is working with our pool, Brunel, and the other members of the pool to develop climate aware investing, and Brunel's climate change policy can be found on their website, and I'm really happy to drop that in writing to you, including the link for you. But thank you so much. Thank you once again, Councillor Claire Paul. Thank you. I'm going to move now to item six on your agenda. That is the COVID-19 outbreak update. I'm inviting the Chief Executive and the Director of Public Health to provide an update on the COVID-19 pandemic and the emergency response since the onset of the second national breakdown. Item 11 is related to COVID-19, so the Chair of Council will propose that the Council considers it at this point in the agenda. So now we move to the Chief Executive, then the Director of Public Health, please. Chief Executive. Chairman, good morning. Uh, Council, good morning. Hopefully everybody can uh, both see and hear. Um, I 
just give a very quick um, introduction, if I may, uh, just regarding the working of the council uh, during this uh, upcoming period. And then I'll move over to uh, to, uh, to Trudy, if I may. Uh, obviously, uh, just a little bit of a backstory. Given the unprecedented uh, global situation and the speed with which the pandemic took hold in uh, March, it was inevitable that, that uh, emergency governance arrangements for the county council would be needed. And indeed, these arrangements were mirrored across uh, England as uh, councils were forced to suspend their usual democratic uh, arrangements. Typically, during this period, responsibility for the decisions uh, of how we re uh, we use our resources uh, fell to me and my senior officers, albeit in consultation with, uh, with, see, with the leader and senior cabinet members. Um, you may recall, uh, in response to the situation in early July, uh, welcome new regulations came into force, enabling councils and their committees to meet virtually uh, without without uh, needing uh, colleagues on the call to be physically um, um, uh, present and therefore we could resume uh, the democratic process earlier than we might otherwise have expected. And as I say, that was very welcome. Uh, um, you'll, you will be aware and you'll hear more from Trudy in a moment and that we're now in the midst of a, a second lockdown situation, a second um, spike, if you like, in the pandemic. And just I just need to say that the council is effectively on an emergency uh, footing once again, working with emergency services and other lo other partners to support our communities. However, unlike the first lockdown in spring, we have established the virtual meeting arrangements, and quite rightly, these will uh, these will continue through throughout this particular emergency period. In other words, the democratic process will and must continue as normal. However, I did just want to use this opportunity to highlight that the services that we uh, will likely need to be prioritised uh, during this ongoing emergency response. Obviously, we don't know the transit of, of the epidemic in Somerset looking into the future. And we, we're all very, very hopeful that uh, a virus uh, a vaccine or a number of vaccines will become available to us in the near future. However, there's no guarantee that that will be a rapid rollout. And indeed, anybody who you would care to listen to would caution against uh, expecting a, a, a massive shift uh, over the winter period. So we have to plan that this response and, and the peak and any subsequent activities will continue during what is inevitably, usually, a difficult period. That's the winter period. And so we have this overlay. Therefore, members will likely see some services scale back or stop as we redeploy staff to frontline COVID activity potentially testing, definitely more contact tracing, and also hopefully to support the future rollout of any vaccine when it arrives. Uh, we also need to support our frontline care services and our, our, our NHS colleagues. That will indeed have an impact. So we just need to be mindful of that, be careful of the well-being of our staff so that we can protect these these core services over the winter period. We will, of course, ensure that members of the council are fully informed uh, of any, uh, any service changes or any changes to service standards. But they are somewhat inevitable as we go into the next period. I'll, of course, be very happy to report back if, if that suits to the next full council meeting in February uh, regarding our emergency response. And I hope that we will brief councillors in the in the meantime as we go through um, and so we are absolutely committed to continue to continue the briefing process and ensure full visibility and chair if i may with that i'd like to hand over to trudy as the director of public health to update you on the progression of the epidemic in, in somerset at the moment thank you thank you pat flaherty chief executive of somerset county council i'm calling now on the director of public health mrs trudy grant please Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to start by giving you a, a bit of a general position about where we are with the epidemic locally. So uh, many of you will have, will have also already seen the uh, dashboard that we produce on a, a daily basis during the weekdays um, and, and uh, hopefully also will have seen the narrative that we've started to produce on a weekly basis going along with that. So um, the most recent information that we've got, so the most up-to-date position, absolutely as of today. Um, so uh, in general, we are seeing an increase in figures across our county, as I'm, I'm sure you're well aware. So since the start of the pandemic, we've seen 4,315 positive cases 
um, in our county. Uh, at the moment, that puts our rate per 100,000 population at 134.3. So you can see that it has gone up um, quite a bit, particularly over this last week. Or so. um, just to give you a little bit of perspective as to where that is with in relation to everywhere else. So the England average at the moment is 270 per 100,000 and the South West average is 193 per 100,000. So we're, we are lower than the England average and we're lower than the South West average, but we are absolutely increasing um, and we have no room for being complacent. I think it's also useful just to point out that particularly around the north of our patch, uh, we are seeing quite considerably higher numbers. So Bristol today are on 486. Six, North Somerset on 305, South Gloucestershire 344 and Baines 248. So particularly around the north of our patch, uh, we are seeing considerably more infection. And as, as I've said to you many, many times before, a virus knows no boundaries. Uh, so, so, so actually that does have an impact on our numbers because because a number of people will travel to those areas, a number of people very, uh, live very close to the borders of those areas, and, and the infection, uh, as I say, doesn't, doesn't necessarily stick to those patches. So I think overall, I think we're doing, uh, we're doing a good job at keeping our rates as low as we possibly can. But obviously, as time goes on, the rates are increasing, and it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we stick to the, uh, stick to the rules as much as possible. Um, I'm hoping that next week we should start to see what the effects of this second lockdown are. So uh, we're hoping that that we should start to see a levelling off, hopefully. Uh, as you, you know, this lockdown isn't isn't as strict as the first one we, we went to. So, so actually, it is a little bit of an unknown at the moment, but hopefully we should start to see some figures next week, which will decide on uh, whether the lockdown has been a successful success or not. Um, so with regards to the priorities for us going forward, our priority absolutely remains with outbreak management. So, so we continue to work really hard when we get outbreaks happening or clusters, we continue to work really hard to make sure that we work with the local area, with the local business, whatever the outbreak is in, to get that infection under control as quickly as possible. And with all infections, speed is of the essence. So part of what we're doing at the moment is looking, as Pat has said, is looking at building that capacity that we've got as we get more and more outbreaks and more and more cases, actually we do need to pull more people into the outbreak management work. So that's one part of the work that we're doing. The second part is around looking at further development of our contact tracing. We've been doing enhanced contact tracing for um, probably three months now, and it has been really useful, hopefully not just on, on the actual contact tracing and finding the contacts, but also it's been really helpful for us as a public health team to know how the, uh, how the, the virus is transmitting. The third thing that we're looking at developing is further development of testing. So we are continuing to develop our testing options as time's moving moving on. And potentially as new technologies come on stream, we'll be looking to use them as, as an appropriate uh, testing method as well. And, and fourthly, we are starting to look towards the vaccination program, um, which importantly, we do need to make sure that we're ready for. So once a vaccine becomes available, we're ready to go at a, lo to a local area as fast as possible. Um, so, so really, our, our aims over the next few months are absolutely totally to keep the infection rates down as low as we can. The more we can squash the infection rates, the better we will be, the more capacity we will have in our health and care services to support people if they need it. Um, but importantly, um, the, the hopefully the fewer deaths we, we will have at a local area as a result of COVID. So um, I finally just want to say thank you to all of the elected members. Many of you have been involved at a local level and you've been absolutely fantastic. Um, and my plea is really just keep up the good work. Uh, the messages to get across to the public are absolutely that hands, face, space, and that continues to be so 
even though we're in lockdown, if people are out and about, they still need to make sure that that, that message gets across and, and particularly once we get out of lockdown. So that's it from me, Chair, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, a question from the Chair, um, Ms. Trudy. Would you uh, like to comment on this excellent uh, bit of news that came out yesterday? And I see it's on the top part of uh, your, your sign there about the um, the link that you can go, somerset.gov.uk backslash coronavirus. I'll try and put it on the screen, so hopefully that should come up now. I don't know if it will. No, it burns itself out, sadly. It came out yesterday, and I was speaking to an officer at County Hall, uh, and, and she hoped that we'd be able to publicise it for you. So perhaps if you'd like to, to raise that so councillors can be aware of it, please. Yeah, so so councillors should now have a direct link. So so that in, that should take you directly into the uh, to the daily dashboard that we update, and also to the uh, weekly information that is an explanatory kind of uh, information about the dashboard. So hopefully, you should now be able to find it easier than we, than we previously were able to. So Thanks. the information is at your fingertips. Sorry to have put you on the spot just then, yeah, but I did promise I'd try and raise it somehow if I could fine. creep it in. Um, I see John Hunt has got a question for you. Councillor John Hunt. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to you, Trudy. Um, yeah, just a, a localised question, actually. For, I've had a, a couple of questions from residents on this. Um, they've picked up that the um, for Bishop's Hull and Norton Fitzwarren are joined together in, in this data. I don't quite understand why, but it's only on the .gov uh, website. Uh, but on there, worryingly, they're showing the total number of cases in the Somerset and West, Somerset, West and Taunton area as 55 new cases. This is up until the 10th of November. Um, however, Bishops Hull and Norton Fitzwarren are 21 of those 55 cases, which I find very worrying, and clearly that's concerning the residents. Um, and it's giving a rate for the area of of Bishop's Hull, Norton, Fitzwarren joined together of 215.9 per 100,000 population. Do you have any, I, I'm assuming it's because of our number of, um, we, we have quite a heavy number of uh, care homes here. I'm only assuming that's the case, but I wondered if you knew any better, and if not, if you could come back to me on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, then that's fine. Um, I think the, the reason that the areas are joined up together is because government use things called um, uh, medium super output areas and it covers a, um, a certain number of population and so that is one medium super output area. So that's the, the, the picture in the map shows the medium super output areas. So that's why those two areas are joined up together. Um, that, that particular area does have a number of care homes. I wouldn't need to go back and check to see whether those care homes have cases in or not and that's what's driving those numbers i can't remember all the specific areas i'm afraid but um but i can i can certainly talk to you behind the scenes about what how what what those numbers are made up of if you would like thank you Trudy. that would be helpful thank you yeah thank you i move now to councillor lee redmond who has a question for you chair thank you for the opportunity to speak um truly thank you for your update um uh, I know that the work that your team are doing is amazing. Um, on that, the, the, my question is uh, something, some clarification really. Um, you talked about an enhanced contact tracing system that you operate locally. Could you just clarify what that involves and how that fits in with the stuff that's going on nationally, please? Yeah, yeah. So, so the national contact tracing um, is done at three levels. So the first level um, is is level two, actually, which is a bit odd. So level two, most of the um, the positive cases come into level two nationally. They are the cases and are then contact traced and the contacts found from that are then passed to level three for further contact tracing. So the enhanced contact tracing that we're doing is attached to that level two of the national contact tracing and what they do is the level two contact tracers try to get hold of people if they haven't managed to get hold of people within 24 hours they then allocate those people to us at a local level to continue to try to get hold of people so so that's the enhancement enhancement so so it's really important that that the national the national 
national system um, takes quite a number of the, the numbers because it's a big, a big system. But actually, what we want to do is to try and make sure we pick up as many of those confirmed cases as we possibly can. So, so at a local level, that's how we enhance it. So we use the same IT system, we input into the national IT system, but the cases are passed down to us if they can't get hold of them within 24 hours. And just to be clear, the tier one of the contact, the national contact tracing is when um, there is a, a particular situation or a particular at-risk individual might be associated with care home or, um, or hospital or something like that. And that's escalated to public health England at a regional level to manage. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you both. Uh, Councillor Mike Rigby. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the, the presentation, Trudy, and the, the, the questions that you've answered. You answered some of mine already but I've still got a couple left. Um, is there enough testing capacity in, in Somerset and are local test results being received quickly enough? Perhaps you could give us the, the average response time for test results in our county. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we have got enough. I think someone might have a microphone still on. I'm getting feedback. Um, we have, have got um, enough testing capacity in our county so um, over the last few weeks, the capacity has come back up again. I, I, I think uh, probably last time we spoke, it was uh, it was being pulled up to the north where the incidents were higher. So our, our testing capacity has improved considerably over the last few weeks. So I'm quite confident that we've got enough testing capacity in the county. Um, the testing, the, the times taken to get the tests back depend on the route of testing. So where where people are using things like the race course testing, actually we are getting those test results back usually, not always, but usually quite quickly within 24 to 48 hours. Where people are using the postal test or testing kits which are available, that can vary quite a bit and actually some of those are coming back three, four, five days later. So actually what we want to try and do as part of our testing is to see if we can get more local centres so as that people don't have to use that postal testing kit quite so much if we can get away with it because the more we can get local centres set up the better we will get a, a faster response rate on the testing does that make sense it does thank you very much okay councillor hugh davis councillor hugh davis thank you thank you chair Trudy, thank you for all your efforts on our behalf. Can I just ask you one important question to our, my area, West Somerset? Where we're integrated with Taunton Dean now, and we see the figures changing quite dramatically at times, is there no chance that we can have our figures separate, or is it the way it's set up and we can't? Thank you. Um, you, you already have your figures separately with regards to the numbers. So if you look at the map in the dashboard, Hugh, you'll be able to see your numbers by medium super output area. So you, you do have access to that information. The only bit that we don't have um, it's explicitly in there is your uh, rate per 100,000 for the whole of West Somerset. Is that the bit that you were talking about? Yes, thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. OK, we, we may well be able to do that. We'll see if we, we can we can do that for you. Thank you so much. Councillor John Parham. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning, Trudy. Um, we've seen uh, quite a dramatic change around in my division. Uh, literally over the space of the the weekend, uh, mm -hmm. we've gone. Uh, Shetland Valley has gone from being just about the lowest rate uh, anywhere in the county uh, uh, to into the top tier of infection rates. I uh, say so within the space of a few days. So I'm just wondering, can you give me any sort of idea as to what, why that is? This is it a single outbreak? with lots of people involved or is it is it more a more general spread within the community 
And uh, the other question I have is regarding Yeovil District Hospital. Uh, all over the news last night that, that the hospital has a, uh, a major issue with, with infections within the hospital. Uh, could you give us an update as to what's happening there, please? Yeah. So, uh, John, forgive me, I can't keep all of the, um, of the medium super output areas in my head at once. So I'm quite happy to talk to you you offline about what the uh, what the situation is in Shetland and why those numbers have gone up. I, what I would say to everybody is that um, when you're taking these very, very small areas, the numbers will go up really quickly because well, the rates will go up really quickly, even if you get a relatively small number change because you're talking about quite small populations. So it, those those variations will happen quite fast, but they they are often just as a result of just a few cases confirmed. So so I would say take take more of more of a longer term look at the patch. I would say, um, and we will get we will get rises and we will get falls as 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 outbreaks happen. It may well be it's just a case of a number of people in one household that's pushed up one particular super output area. So. Just just take those because they are very small numbers. So take them with a bit of a pinch of salt because they will go up quickly, but they will also come back down quickly. Um, so I, I'm quite happy to talk to you offline around what's happening um, in the Shepton area, just so you've got some information. Um, with regards to Yeovil Hospital, both of our acute hospitals, as have, uh, as many across the country, have um, have obviously been taking COVID patients in as they've needed health care, but they've also, both of our acute hospitals have had outbreaks, um, which has meant that there's been a degree of hospital transmission within the acute setting. Um, I think across the southwest, there's something like 120 um, outbreaks uh, going on at the moment across um, in, the, in the acute setting. So it's not something that's um, abnormal in any shape or form. The hospital has been working really well with us to try and bring the situation back under control again. And it is looking as though it's now coming, uh, becoming back under control again. Uh, so uh, Musgrove also had the same um, problem a, a few weeks ago and have brought theirs back under control. It, it is really difficult because obviously the, the staff uh, are coming in, patients are coming in, visitors, although restricted, are coming in. So it's really difficult to keep um, virus, which is you know not able to be seen, out of, out of a hospital setting in that way. So it's pretty inevitable, to be honest, that at times during a pandemic, you are going to get hospital outbreaks. And the infection control teams that we've got in our hospitals are working really hard and doing a fantastic job at making sure they cohort patients, making sure all the infection control measures are in place. Um, but it is pretty inevitable at times like this you will get uh, outbreaks and then we try to bring them back under control again thank you Trudy and if you can uh, if you get time to contact me later on I'd appreciate it thank you yeah sure thank you Trudy Grant the director of public health I'm now going to move to the requisitioned item that's item 11 and you'll find this on page 239 of the agenda and I'm going to invite Councillor Dimery as the proposer to present the requisition item as set out on that page. Councillor Dimery, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, during the many online COVID briefings we've been able to attend as councillors, we've often voiced our appreciation to the public health team for their work on tracking and tracing infection. The modest answer we've received from Trudy Allison and the team is it's what we do. Indeed, whether it's an outbreak of scarlet fever, viral meningitis, tracking and isolating infectious diseases is what they do. COVID-19 requires the same principle, but with much a much greater level of resources. Recently, we were told that the team carried out their own track and trace exercise and reached over 90% of those needing to isolate. This pattern seems to have been repeated elsewhere. For example, Councillor James Jamieson, Chairman of the Local Government Authority, stated recently, Council's expert skills and knowledge of local areas has been illustrated by recent COVID-19 test and trace figures. 
These show that cases handled by local public health teams are continuing to reach the vast majority of complex cases assigned to them, with a tremendous 97.7% of people contacted and asked to self-isolate. This compares with the declining figures for those contacted by the NHS test and trace, who successfully contacted 62.6% of the close contacts for the cases assigned to them. What Councillor Jameson diplomatically declines to point out is the NHS test and trace is, of course, mainly run by private companies who have been in receipt of hundreds of millions of pounds of public funding. The lack of expertise and understanding standing in their delivery has been evident here in Somerset. When setting up a testing station in Froome, for example, local town council staff reported that Serco operatives were not initially equipped with PPE and even turned it down when offered by council staff. We've also seen the remarkable success of our own county council officers had in procuring and supplying millions of items of PPE uh, into our care homes, as opposed to the disastrous outsourcing of private companies by central government. It is clear that the entire process needs to be handed over to the experts already employed on the ground who know their local areas and can act efficiently. So I call upon the council to approve a letter to be sent by the leader of the council to the Secretary of State to ask the necessary finance and resources be given to Somerset County Council to enable our officers to enact safer, more efficient means of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, including vaccination in our towns and parishes. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Dimery. I'm going to turn to Lee Redman, who I understand is trying to indicate that he puts his hand up, but I don't see his hand. Councillor Redman. Chair, I'm, I'm just happy to second the motion and reserve my right to speak to the end of the debate. Thank you. Yes, you are down on the uh, agenda, and I was going to turn to you now to uh, second that. So you're the next person on the list. So I'm, I'm still going to invite you to uh, to speak if you wish to as seconder. Thank you, Chair. Again, I I'm happy to second the motion, but reserve my right to speak to the end of the debate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And now then, we'll invite council members to speak and if you wish to speak could you please indicate with a raised hand council members please david fothergill the leader thank you chairman um that sounds like that was uh, <laughs> that sounds like that was an alert coming in it's just um, jeremy Corbyn, well, don't worry yeah i i, I got that mic um so, uh, so I'm a bit disappointed that Martin took the opportunity there to have a few uh, political digs because on the whole I support his, fully support his requisitioned item. Some of the comments I don't agree with, um, but we will debate those another day. I think today is about supporting our public health uh, colleagues uh, and, and, and seeing how what, and what more we can do really to, to help them to do their job better. Um, but I, I would like to just broaden the scope of the recommendation if he is happy with that. Our public health team has put in a huge shift over the past seven months to combat the virus. They've worked to reduce transmission and linked with partners to protect the NHS. As Martin has said, it has been an excellent and effective work. Uh, however, there are other teams who have worked equally hard to support our public health colleagues. And I would like to publicly... Uh, can I just say, I think Tessa may have a microphone on which is interrupting. Thank you. Um, so, however, there are other teams who have worked equally hard to support our public health colleagues, and I'd like to publicly thank all of those who have played their part in helping Somerset have some of the lowest rates of the virus in England. It is, of course, troubling to see the rates rising, and we've heard from the Director of Public Health this morning some of the issues behind that. And in some areas, the, 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 the rises are significant, and we all have a responsibility to follow the government guidelines. It's not somebody else's job to follow the guidelines, it's our own. And we have to remember to hands, face and space. I'd like to put my on record my thanks to all the public and the private sector um, employees and colleagues in Somerset who have really pulled together in these difficult times. From businesses that have had to close to our health and district colleagues, it really has shown that what we could do when we pull together as one. Looking at the future, it is clear that there are further opportunities for this council and its partners to provide the low 
technical support and knowledge that is so important to fight the pandemic. Under the leadership of Trudy Grant, our Director of Public Health, we have led the South West in enhanced contact tracing, and I know we are looking to do more in that area. We have been expanding the testing offer in Somerset for the past few months, and we will continue to do so as the needs of the pandemic dictate. And of course, we are looking to vaccinations and already planning how we can contribute to this to support our NHS colleagues. So much great work from teams up and down this council and others. I'm proud of the work that has gone on. I would support any approach to recognise it formally and to enable more work to be delegated from government to Somerset. I would therefore support Martin Dimery's requisition item. Thank you. Councillor Tessa Munt. Councillor Tessa Munt. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was actually going to propose an amendment, but actually David has covered quite a lot of his items. But my amendment was going to be that um, we wanted to praise um, Trudy's team um, and just comment on the fact that where local tracing has achieved success in approximately 90 percent of cases, as opposed to the 60 percent that's being achieved nationally. Um, we, we just wanted to make that comment and just say where huge amounts of public money being directed to the public sector. But I think um, David's probably covered quite a lot of that and um, I commend Martin's um, motion. It's fine. Thank you, Councillor Munt. Thank you. I'm looking for further hands, but I don't see any as yet. Anybody else wish to speak? Any other councillor, please? I'm seeing nobody indicating. Councillor Lee Redmond. Chair, thank you. Um, based on the previous comments, um, just to clarify, I'm grateful for all the hard work our staff have taken up to help support and care for those in need during the pandemic. I support the comments made earlier and commend our Director of Health, our Director of Public Health and her team. The way that members have been kept up to date in, with issues is absolutely amazing. The motion is sensible on so many levels. We have shown at every stage that we are doing things better at the localist level. If government had seen sense to pass a small portion of the money that has been handed over to big business, I know that we would be in a better position locally than we are now. As has already been said, our enhanced contact tracing has been bailing out these big companies. We need government to support our enhanced contact tracing and this letter will further emphasise the good work we are already doing from our own budget. Please support this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lee Redmond. I don't see any other hands raised, uh, in which case uh, I'm going to... Well, I think the Leader of Council has responded, so I, I, I don't think he wishes to respond any further. And I think that we will uh, now move it to the monitoring officer to organise the vote. Thank you, Chair. And as requested, I think members are used to the, the format of this in the virtual meetings of Council. Uh, what I will do is I will read out alphabetically uh, the names of each councillor uh, and take your vote. Um, if, you can, if you could just uh, unmute your microphone just to indicate, please. So if I start with Councillor Best. Four. Councillor Bloomfield. Four. Councillor Bowne. Did you ask me, Councillor Bowne? I did, Councillor Bowne, sorry. Yes, yes. yes. Councillor Broom. Four. Councillor Clayton. Four. Councillor Caswell. Four. Councillor Chilcott. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Coles. Four. Councillor Dance. Four. Councillor Davies. Four. Councillor Dimery. Four. Councillor Filmer. Four. Councillor Fabergill. Four. Councillor Fashini. Four. Councillor Gobier. Councillor Gobier present. Not Shane, therefore I should move on. Uh, Councillor Grosscop. She's, in she's indicated for, I have that four. message. Councillor Hall. 
four, that's a hammer, four, that's a Healy, four, that's a Hewitt Cooper, Chairman, he may be offline at the moment. I think he had a uh, an urgent medical appointment yeah, with his daughter. Thank you. Yes. Scott, can you hear Joined me? By phone. He came in on the phone, though. I, I can, I, I can hear Councillor Cooper now. Sorry, Councillor Hewitt Cooper. Uh, so, I, I've only just dialed in, so I shouldn't be voting on this one. Confirming, Councillor. Uh, Councillor James Hunt. Four. Councillor John Hunt. Four. Councillor Huxtable. Four. Councillor Keating. Councillor Kendall. Four. Councillor Lawrence. Four. Councillor Lewis. Four. Councillor Leishon. Four. Councillor Jane Locke. Four. Councillor Tony Locke. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Munt. Four. Councillor Napper. Yes, agree. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Noel. Four. Councillor Oliver. Four. Councillor Parham. Four. Councillor Paul. Four. Councillor Price Anke. Four. Councillor Pullin. Four. Four. Councillor Perbrick. Four. Councillor Redman. Four. Councillor Redman. Four. Councillor Four. Councillor Ruddle. Four. Councillor Taylor. Four. Councillor Thorne. He's both <laughs> four by chat. Scott. Thanks for confirming, Jamie. Uh, Councillor Verdon. Four. Councillor VJ. Four. Councillor Wallace. Four. Councillor Wedderkop. Four. Councillor Josh Williams. Four. Councillor Rod Williams. Four. Councillor Woodman. Four. In which case I'm uh, pleased to report, Chair, and that, uh, that has majority support. So that motion is carried and agreed. Excellent news. Thank you. Scott, uh, Councillor Govier also voted for due, through the chat. He had a Teams issue as the vote started. Noted, Jamie. Thank you. Right. Um, we would ordinarily now move to item seven, the one Somerset request for deferral, but uh, that was due to start at 10 past 11, and it is now 11.33. I'm going to suggest that rather than start that debate and then immediately stop for five minutes for the comfort break at 11.50, we take the comfort break now so we can go fresh into the debate and continue it as normal. Uh, I'm looking to the monitoring officer to see if he agrees. That's what we'll do now, everyone. If you now take a five-minute break, I time it as 11.34, about to be 11.35. We'll start again at 11.40. Thank you.
are in attendance. That's all councillors. When you come back on, thank you, Councillor Locke, um, <laughs> Councillor Fothergill, Councillor Keating, all noted. Um, can the rest of you please? Yes, yeah, that's good. Chairman, can you hear me? It's Nigel HC. I'm here. I can, Nigel. I can. I can. Councillor Ho Hugh Sorry, Cooper. Yep, thank you. Yep. You're on a phone, I understand. I am indeed, yeah. Okay, thank you. We know that. Thank you. It looks as if most are back in the room. Okay, above 34, is it? 35. <coughs> Councillor Paul. Uh, up, down, up, down. I'm here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paul. So good of you. <laughs> All right. I'm, I, I, it seems to me that uh, everybody now is back in the room. And at 11.42, we're going to continue. And we're going to start now straight in uh, with item seven, one Somerset. Uh, the Can I just uh, say, Chairman, I've had a, a message from Mike Rigby saying his machine has just crashed. So he's now had to leave the meeting. So he's going to try and join again. Thank Sorry you, Adam. Button. Um, I will wait then, I'll wait a minute, just because I think we uh, need all our councillors here, uh, so I'll wait uh, one minute for Councillor Rigby to try and log back on. Thank you, and Simon Cole still hasn't managed to get in, so I don't know if technical help is still trying to help him or not. Uh, I think we'll ask technical to see if they can, uh, well, I'm, getting a, I'm getting a nod I'm from technical. Back in. Yes, yeah, Simon is back in, Adam. We've um, yeah. sorted him out. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, great. Thank well, you. I don't know quite what tech, uh, what the techie boys did, but um, they seem to have got me back in. Thank you, Simon. <sighs> Councillor Rigby, are you back with us? No, he's still not. I may suggest that if he can't get back in, that he calls in. That wouldn't seem sense. Yeah, if all members you'd care to drop your hands now, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Mike. I think Mike's Mike. in now looking at the screen. <laughs> Are you with us? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience, councillors and the members of the public. We will now continue, and that will be item seven, one Somerset. This is the request for deferral of the 2021 County Council elections. Your pages are 27 to 32 on your agenda item. And I'm going to start by inviting Councillor David Fothergill, the leader, to introduce the item. Councillor Fothergill. Thank you, Chairman. Just making sure that my microphone and my camera's on. Um, so I will introduce this item and I'll propose the item and then I'll hand to Mandy Chilcott to second the item. Um, so following the uh, the uh, vote at full council on the 29th of July for uh, to approve the one Somerset business case, we subsequently received a letter from um, Robert Jenrick, the Secretary of State of MHCLG, um, who wrote to the five councils in Somerset, uh, the four districts, the county, and also in addition to North Somerset and to Baines. That letter was received on October the 8th, inviting all of those councils to uh, submit final proposals for reorganisation of local government in Somerset to be with him by the 9th of November. And also he requested that the uh, final proposals, any final supporting evidence be supported, be submitted by the 9th of December. So uh, we have subsequently heard that uh, North Somerset, and I think I, I mentioned this to David Redwell, that North Somerset uh, do not uh, do not want to take part in this uh, this discussion in terms of uh, local government in Somerset. And in fact, um, my conversation with the leader of that council uh, was along the lines of that their future is looking towards the north and towards Bristol, and we'll know that they are currently making application to join the West of England Combined Authority. 
We also know that Baines at the same time um, took a vote through their full council last week, uh, rejecting any uh, notion that they wish to be involved um, to, to in the future of local government reorganisation within uh, the Sur <coughs> Somerset area. So any concept of the cricketing county, I'm afraid, is not there. And I believe that there are now two business cases which will be or have been submitted to the Secretary of State, or one from the County Council being the one Somerset business case and one from the District Council. Um, the uh, department, the MHCLG, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, have indicated that their formal consultation on these two business cases will be held in February and March of next year, with a decision being made in June or July. That consultation effective period effectively starts the unitary process and as such triggers the process for a decision by the Secretary of State should he wish to defer a scheduled election ahead of vesting of a new authority. In a statement to Parliament, four days after he wrote the letter to uh, the authorities within Somerset, on the 13th of October, Robert Jenrick, the Secretary of State, um, said, I recognise that when making proposals, councils may request that the May 2021 in local elections in the area are postponed. Such postponement of local elections we, where unitization is under consideration is precedented, and I will carefully consider any such requests. I'm sure that members will be aware that there have been a number of similar deferments, uh, most recently of Buckinghamshire um, in, its, uh, in its move to a unitary authority. This is not unprecedented, as the Secretary of State uh, wrote. Um, we'll also be, members may also be conscious that there are two other local authority county areas which are currently going through the unitarisation process as well, um, they being Cumbria and North Yorkshire. Um, both of those uh, authorities have indicated that they will also be applying for the deferment of the May 2021 election and we expect that uh, those letters will be with the Secretary of State ahead of the 9th of uh, December uh, deadline. Given the likely timescale of MHCLG's consultation and the Secretary of Statement's clear statement, I believe that we now, as Somerset County Council, should request a deferral on the May 2021 election. I must stress that this is not us voting to defer the election. That is not within our gift. That is not within our power. That remains with the Secretary of State. Um, the request today is for myself as leader to write to the Secretary of State requesting that he considers a deferment of that election in May 2021. It is for the Secretary of State to determine that. It is the Secretary of State's decision alone and the Secretary of State will make that decision one way or the other ahead of that May 2021 election. But I believe that we now need to give clear I could give a clear request to the Secretary of State to defer the May 2021 election so that we can stand down any planning so that we have a clear route through the, the transition into a unitary authority, whatever that unitary authority looks like, and that we have transparency of the process leading up to the next election, which I believe would be a unitary election in either May 2022 or May 2023. Therefore, I am pleased to bring forward this paper to full council and seek full council support to make that request to the Secretary of State to defer the scheduled 2021 county council election uh, until such time as the Secretary of State determines either to hold a county council election as part of the transition or to hold a unitary election as part of the new council. I will now hand over to uh, Mandy Chilcott to second the item and happy to answer any questions. I already know that there's one or two um, pending. Councillor Chilcott, please. Thank you, Leader. I'd just like to second the motion. I don't have anything to add at this moment in time, but would like to reserve my right to speak later if I need to. Thank you, Councillor Chilcott. I'm now going to invite Councillor Jane Locke to ask her question. Uh, this is the submitted question in Annex A. Councillor Locke. I, th I think Councillor Locke, you were muted then. Um. Chairman, thank you. I'm happy for the question to be taken as read, but I would also like to speak in the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Locke. I'm now going to... I, I I beg your pardon. I think, Chairman, I need to answer the question before we move to the debate. Councillor Fothergill. 
Thank you. Um, so thank you, Jane. Um, and uh, the question relates to the deferment of uh, the election and, and should it take place later in the year. Um, I, I've got to say, I, I looked at the monitoring officer with, the, with uh, some horror that uh, on his face that we may be organising an election in a few months' time. That just would not be possible. The earliest that any election could be held if it was deferred would be May 2022 because of uh, legislation going through Parliament and the ability of us to, to organise it. So I I think that the earliest that we could do would be May 2020. I also have to stress um, that we are in a process here. We should not doubt the importance of the letter that was issued on the 8th of um, 8th of October. That letter essentially started the process that we are now seeing through. It is highly unlikely, to, and uh, to my knowledge, it has not, never happened anywhere else, that Secretary of State would now walk away from making a decision on the neutralisation of accounts county that uh, of course is his decision but i'm not aware of any other precedent so so my view is that any deferred election uh, would could not take place before may 2022 at the earliest thank you councillor fothergill i'm now going to invite council members to speak and i will ask you please to remember to raise your hand so we can see that you wish to say something so members it is over to you we we'll start with si simon coles councillor simon coles simon coles Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a question at this point. Uh, by my my view on this subject is that okay. We, uh, I'm going to stop you then because your hand was up, so I turned to you. In that case, uh, I'm going to. My move. apologies, Chair. That was a don't legacy worry. hand. Don't worry, don't worry at all. So I'm, I, I'll turn to Councillor Mike Rigby, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions on this. Um, given that. Councillor Fothergill just told us that the decision won't be made until June next year. Doesn't that mean that with the formation of a shadow authority, we're inevitably looking at 2023 before the new unitary would be vested? I wonder if we could have some clarification on that, because obviously if that's the case, uh, are we now today being asked to support a two-year extension to our current terms so that there would be not so the election wouldn't be held until 2023 uh, and then also i've got a, a couple of questions for uh, probably honor i think probably for the, the county solicitor on this and and that's it is it intended uh, that the that this motion that there would be no further elections to somerset county council so that it would be the next election Oh, hey. I'm sorry, councillor, you're, you're breaking up. You were perfectly clear until a, a few seconds ago. Can you just try that last sentence again? Thank you, I'll do that. So is it the intention of this motion that there would be no further elections to, to Somerset County Council, that the next elections affecting the county council's functions would in fact be the unitary elections? And I've got a subsequent question to that, depending on the answer to, to, to that question. I will ask the county solicitor to respond, please. I think the first part was my mind. Do you want to go first? Let's, let's go then. It would be a matter entirely for the Secretary of State what decision is made. We cannot control his decision. We can only request that he considers it. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn to Councillor Fothergill. I think there's. I, I, so I was slow coming off mute there, Chairman. I know it's. I know it's the saying of the year. I was on mute, but I do apologise. Um, I do think we do need to keep this in perspective. That this is a request. We have no. Uh, we have no. Um, powers to defer an election. We will be heading for an election on May the 6th next year unless the Secretary of State decides differently. Um, this is a request for him to consider a deferral of that election. Um, so to ask, answer your question, Mike, of um, when a shadow authority could come in, when it could be achieved, uh, uh, and is it one year or two year? In, clearly in our business case that we are aiming for a vesting date of the 1st of April 2022, which means that the first elections for the new unitary authority would be on the 1st of May, or sorry, the 7th of May um, 2022. That is within our business case. That's what we continue to argue for. We have argued for nothing different and argued for no longer time period. It is entirely up to the Secretary of State to determine 
whether that is the case or not. And I'm afraid that I can't answer for the Secretary of State. I can answer for lots of people, but not for the Secretary of State. He wouldn't welcome it. Um, and ju and just to support what the uh, what the uh, the Captain Slister has just said, um, it is for the Secretary of State to determine. And again, this is worded in such a way that it, it, it recognises his role and recognises that he may call a county election as part of a unitary transition process. So this is worded very carefully, um, but recognise that this is not our role to make a decision. And all I'm doing is asking for uh, approval to write a letter. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. Mm -hmm. Councillor Rigby, you had a, a supplementary question, I believe. I did, yes. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity of asking that. And that, So from what Councillor Fothergill has just told us, in the business plan and the request going forward from us, there would be no election to Somerset County Council. Again, we, we've had the last one in 2017. So if it's vested in 2022, and we're asking for the elections to be uh, to be postponed, then clearly there's no further election to Somerset County Council. The next elections that we're asking for, it's not our decision, but the next elections we're asking for would be the unitary election. So I just wonder how we square that with the advice in 1.3 of the report, which says that the Secretary of State cannot cancel the election. That's exactly what he would be doing. There would be no further election to Somerset County Council the 2021 elections would effectively be cancelled and we're being told that he doesn't have the power to do that. I, I think you're, you're mixing, mixing it all up again, Mike. Um, we are not requesting uh, a cancellation of the um, county council election. Uh, we are asking for a deferment until the date that he sees as appropriate. That's entirely clear in the wording of the requisite of the item. Um, and it is for the Secretary of State to determine it. We don't know, actually, with this if there would be any further county council election because actually that's not the request that we're making we're making a request to defer the may 2021 election it's as clear as that it is for the secretary of state to determine and no matter how many times you try to uh, to get me to say that that would be the last election i can't say it because actually i don't know it I mean, it's the secretary of state to determine not this council okay but if i could just ask then chair where, when would you see the the next election happening if you're asking for it to be deferred and not cancelled when would it? When would you see it happening as part of this request? Can I say can that I, I suspect that that's really down to the Secretary of State to make that decision? None, none of us here would know the answer to that. We so I, a, I suspect, it, Mike, that it's it's the Secretary of State's decision. Okay, Mike, I I, I I assume that you're happy, well, not happy, but you're content that you've asked your questions. Thank um, you for the opportunity to speak there. That's and none of the thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll move to Councillor Neil Bloomfield. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. A question to the leader, really. Um, I find it extraordinary when we have elections which the districts and the county sort of happen every two years that we either curtail the districts or we extend the county. There is no real option otherwise. Um, and also the fact that we'd be holding an election in May and the planning that's involved in that election um, I'm no expert on this at the county, but I would imagine that takes considerable amount of planning. And uh, the county were criticised for actually commencing this process during COVID. Well, surely holding an election during COVID is, is just as foolhardy. Um, also, if we held the election next year, we'd most likely be holding another one the following year. So there's a million pounds straight away. So it makes good financial sense. And, and Councillor Rigby and I have had this discussion online in uh, one of those wonderful chat rooms on Facebook. Um, so to me, it's eminently sensible. But I have a question, and Honor may want to come in on this one as well. Um, one of the district councils is now using its officers' um, email accounts and putting a strap line on there promoting the Stronger Somerset uh, message. And actually, their website says, will lead to a better future. Now, I was always told that officers were apolitical. Um, I have a concern that officers are perhaps being used to promote the message, the political message of an authority, um, rather than the politicians promoting what is in fact a political um, idea. So there's two questions there. I'd be grateful for an answer. Thank you, Neil. I'm going to turn to the to the legal advisor, Honour. Uh, thank you very much. It would be completely inappropriate for me to comment on what is happening in another authority. That is a matter entirely for them and any challenge would be to that authority, not to this one. 
Thank you. Neil, I take it that you're happy with that answer? Um, could, Chair, could I, could I just come back on that? Could I change the wording of the question to honour then? Would you be satisfied if, you're, if the strategic directors of Somerset County Council were promoting the stronger Somerset model? Again, I think that's probably invidious asking the legal advisor to give that uh, private opinion, and I'm going to save her the embarrassment of having to answer it. Uh, so that's my ruling. Sorry, Neil. Um, I'm looking for other hands up, please. And at the moment, I see none. Uh, which I, on an important debate like this, I would have yeah, thought we've got, I'd have I've more. Got mine Councillor now, Locke. Can... Councillor Locke. And then Simon Coles. I see your hands up now. Chair, we've also got um, Councillor Dance and Councillor Reppens, whose hands are up. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I cannot support this re recommendation. I believe it is undemocratic and creates unnecessary uncertainty at this difficult time. However, it is a particularly emotive issue, particularly with so many um, twin hatters within our group, and I have offered the Liberal Democrat a free vote so people can vote exactly the way they feel on the subject. To begin, I cannot understand how on earth the prospect of a scheduled election has any bearing on the transition to a new local government structure for Somerset. The second bullet point in 1.5 states, elections in such circumstances risk confusing voters. I think you might be underestimating the electorate here. A little further on in risks, it says the Secretary of State may not agree to change current local government structure and the election will take place in May 21. But as a decision is not expected until June or July, it would be difficult to see how that could happen. And of course, it would, that wouldn't be confusing at all. All this presumably while the consultation mentioned in 1.5 takes place anyway. Unless all elections are postponed once again due to the continuing pandemic, we can be certain there will be an election in Somerset. The Police and Crime Commissioner election will take place and the cost at that point would be shared, a half price election and a bargain for democracy. Just to add to the confusion in implications in the report, it states that the saving is not a consideration anyway. Also under that heading, it says that the election for a new authority will only be held once, which can only be support for deferring for two years to fit in with the district timetable. If this is the case, at least be honest about it up front. I believe elections can only be deferred one year at a time. And should 21 be deferred, then we will have to wait until March or April of 22 to see if there will be another deferral, creating even further confusion. And that would mean six years for this administration. Forgive me if I've added even more confusion, but in clearly this entire proposal makes no sense at all. It is easy to see why you do not want to face an election. Your own dismal performance here, while nationally, you suffer from Boris's reign of error. It's no wonder you're running scared and don't want the residents of Somerset to be allowed to exercise their democratic right to choose who shapes services in our county for the future. Whether that is through a new structure or we remain a two-tier system, I wrote to you asking me that you don't request a deferral and I ask you once again to let Somerset decide in 2021 in an open and transparent way. Thank you. Councillor Fothergill to respond. You're muted, David. I think James has confused me and a lot more other people more than ever. Um, I'm very clear that uh, if there is a um, consultation per period running February and March on the future of government in Somerset, then to hold a election with that in the um, a PERDA period would be totally inappropriate. And I think that is the part of the reasoning. I can't speak for him, but I would assume that's part of the reasoning why the the Secretary of State said what he did in the written answer. Uh, I, I understand that there's lots of political rhetoric around here, but we are on a transition process here towards a unitary authority, whatever that looks like, and we will need to win that argument. But we are on a process here. We have received that letter of invitation and we are heading towards that unitary authority basis. And I, I think that the to hold an election in May would, would actually... Uh, provide a disservice to the people of Somerset and to that transition period. We need to make it as smooth as possible. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. Councillor Bill Revens. Councillor 
Bill Revens, please. Yeah, just on the way, Mr. Taylor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, my a number of the points I wanted to be raised were made very well by by Councillor Locke, but I think my biggest and most fundamental concern is that we were elected with a democratic mandate that expires after four years. So on the 4th of May, our democratic mandate uh, runs out uh, a little bit like a pint of milk in the fridge. You might accept a short, uh, a short uh, period after the expiration date to be acceptable. But what concerns me about this proposal is the possibility that it could be a two year extension uh, to, to our term of office. And I wouldn't want to drink a pint of milk after two years. I am also very concerned that everything has been passed on to the, it's the Secretary of State, it's the Secretary of State. Well, he won't consider it unless we ask him. So if we don't ask him the question, then we can we can go to our to our electorate, renew our democratic mandate. And if if, if Councillor Fothergill um, is so convinced in the merits of his one Somerset case, we could we could add in a three for the price of one deal on the election and put a referendum on the proposals on the local government reform in Somerset. I think we have every opportunity here to go back to the people of Somerset who we represent and renew our mandate. So fundamentally, I cannot support this proposal. Thank you, Councillor Bill Revens. I'll turn to the leader, Councillor David Fothergill, if he wishes to reply. Well, I can only repeat what, I, what I, I've said before, which is that the request before full council today is to approve me to write a letter to the Secretary of State requesting the deferral of the election. Uh, it is not my decision. It is not this council's decision. It is the Secretary of State's decision. You might not like me saying it, Bill, but that's actually fact. Uh, and I'm afraid that those powers are vested in the Secretary of State, not in me, you or this council and therefore we can make that request um, and the request clearly has been uh, approved in the past with Buckinghamshire and others and it clearly is there for a reason and that is because it would otherwise disrupt a trans smooth transition to a new authority and that would be a disservice to everybody in this county. Thank you Councillor Fothergill. Councillor Adam Dance please. Thank you very much for calling me Chair and I hope you're all well. Firstly, can I just clarify um, whether this is a deferral for one year or longer? Can I first have that question answered and then I want to say one more? Sorry, we seem to have one, two, all, all different things coming forward. So, Councillor Fothergill, could you let me know if it's one year or more? Of course I can, Adam. Um, so I'm not sure that the answer is going to make it any clearer for you. So this decision today is to defer the election of May 2021. We believe that we have a business case, which if our business case is selected, which could be delivered by May 2022, in which case there would be a new unitary authority uh, election as part of that process in May 2022. Um, we have made no further requests then then to defer from May 21. The Secretary of State will determine the process and a lot of the process is determined by his department's capacity to see through uh, local government reform in three different counties at the same time. So in actual fact I don't know the answer to your question Adam. Uh, my request is to defer this, uh, defer this election uh, pending a new unitary authority coming into place, which we believe would be in May 2022. But that is our belief. Again, it comes back to the Secretary of State. Thank you. Um, I have two further questions. One, what well, what happens if he doesn't um, accept our request? Will the elections happen in May if he doesn't accept our request? Absolutely. You, uh, you, you should assume that you are fighting an election on May the 6th next year, just as I and all my candidates for the election that, that you know, we, we're all going through the process of selecting and approving candidates. So uh, we, we should assume that we are fighting an election on May the 6th next year, unless the Secretary of State determines. And, and again, it sounds like I'm shifting the, the responsibility to him, but his responsibility, he is the only person that can cancel that election and he is the only person in law no, sorry not council it can defer the election in law so if this council makes a vote today to not ask him to defer the election so if you don't make the request the election would happen on the 6th of may as well i'm going to invite the 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 legal uh, advisor to make a comment now she wishes to clarify a legal point it is a matter entirely for the secretary 
Secretary of State. If he doesn't get our invitation, it is still a matter that he has complete discretion to make that decision. Thank you for that, Honour. Now, my final question, uh, uh, my final point, and I will be quiet. Um, I have been talking to my parish councils about this proposal. Um, as, as you're all aware, I have quite a rural parish and I have quite a lot of parish councils. And I thought it was only fair to actually talk to them about this and see how they feel. And they're categorically against me voting today in favour of this proposal due to the non-democratic process of this. Um, and also, I just one comment the chair of one of my parishes made last night was, how can councillors morally sit there and vote themselves another another an allowance for another year? How can we sit here and vote ourselves another allowance for for the next year? I mean, if you that's like being in a job role for four years and you you saying to the CEO. I'm going to stay for another year, whether you like it or not. Pay me for another year to do my job. I, I can't support this. It's morally wrong and it's, non, it's not democratic. Um, and the answers I've been receiving today are just too, too, too wishy-washy. I mean, you, you don't know the answers to half of the questions. And if it's down to the Secretary of State, well, let's not bother having this deferral here. Let's let the Secretary of State make his decision let's not push him one way or another let him make the decision let's us we were elected for four years let's have our election thank you thank you i'm going to move now to councillor simon coles thank you chair for calling me in um yes i uh, in agreement with uh, everything adam's just said and and some of my colleagues earlier i cannot understand for example why we can't have the consultation after our scheduled election in may next um we don't need to ask the uh, secretary of state to 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 delay this by one year or quite probably two years if if he his department doesn't have the capacity we have the opportunity in the regular uh, run of uh, the election process in this country uh, of having our election scheduled on the scheduled date of, of, of may of next year um, I, i'm at a loss as to why it is so important david for you to to ask the secretary of state to interfere with the electoral process which is the established electoral process of our county council elections i can't possibly support this uh, it, you know <laughs> the election we we should hold the election in the normal time scale uh, so everybody everybody in, in somerset has the opportunity to vote as they have been used to for decades every four, four years our, our four-year term is up technically in in may next and I think we should we should proceed with an election at that time. The consultation can come afterwards. I think this is a nonsense and I can't possibly support it. Thank you. Councillor Hugh Davis. Councillor Hugh Davis, please. Councillor Hugh Davis. I'm here, Chair. Sorry, I was just uh, sorting things out. Chair, um, being an independent is, is, is very interesting, really because I've never seen such a silly political setup being formed. The, the Liberals, what was it, 13 years ago, wanted just this, i.e. a unity authority. There's an opportunity that it will happen, but leading up to what the motion's all about is this. Put yourself in the uh, thoughts of our communities. They will vote next year if this comes to be, and then the following year, possibly. What they're voting for, for us to serve them at a, with a uni unity authority. Do they realise that the persons that they'd be voting for could more than likely lose their seats because we're going to be reduced to possibly only 100 councillors? So, all their thoughts to who they want to serve for them are lost, which I think is, is nonsense. So we must defer. We must defer. It's, it's not a question of money. The money is still the same. The following year, you're still going to spend it. That, that's not, not my argument. It's what the public are voting for. You, 
her, whoever it is. And we are now going to take that away from those people by having two elections. And the political stats here at the moment, I'm so disappointed. The Liberals who wanted this are now putting all blocks are possible to block it up. Let's do what the motion is asking for. And thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hugh. Councillor Liz Leishon, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just want to ask the leader whether he has considered asking the Secretary of State to defer the public consultation on the future of local government in Somerset until after the County Council election in May 21 is complete. I can't understand why the deferment of the election takes precedence over um, anything else. I, I can't see why deferring public consultation on the future of local government cannot be put back three months to allow for the election so that anybody like any of us would not be looking at a five-year term or possibly even a six-year term. I don't feel that that is democratic. I don't support it. I would like to propose that the leader that, that I would like to propose an amendment, apologies, that Council supports the leader to make a request to the Secretary of State to defer the consultation on the future of local government in Somerset until after the completion of the May 21 County Council election. I have to, to see if I have a seconder. That was Adam Dance, I'm happy was it? to second that, yeah. Adam Dance, okay. Councillor Fothergill. Well, I've got to advise, uh, Liz, that uh, myself and my party were voting against that because that is entirely um, un un unreasonable asking the MHCLG, who have set out the timetable for us, to change their timetable. They're working through three counties' unitisation process, and therefore it's not something that we will support, I'm afraid. Happy to bring it to a vote, but it will not be supported. OK, well, I think the quickest way of doing this is I now have a proposition before me and a seconder is to put it to the vote. So I'm going to turn to Scott and ask him to manage that vote, please. Scott Woodridge, the monitoring officer. Chair, sorry, my hand's been up for some time. I'm uh, sorry, Tessa Munt, I'm, I've, I've made a decision now. Unless it relates to that amendment, can I ask you to wait? Would you be kind enough to wait? Yes, OK. Council Councillor Munt? Does it relate to that amendment? No, it does not. It's to the debate in general, and I don't quite know why we've moved to a vote on an amendment when we haven't even debated it. Mm. Well, that, yes. that's not my decision. It's been uh, it's been called for well, if, by. If that's what Scott says, then that's absolutely. It's fine. been called for and say, seconded. I would just say my. And, well, and under the procedures, I am now. Councillor Munt, I'm not arguing about this. The, there's been a proposer and a seconder for an amendment. And we should now vote on that amendment. I'm looking Jeff, to. There is a point of order, please. Yeah, not before the debate has taken not place. Chair, point I, of order, please. I'm gonna, I, who's calling for a point of order? Uh, it's Samuel Greenfield. Greenfield. Neil. Uh, go ahead. Is it an actual procedural point yes, of order? It, it, it is a, an actual proper point of order, I think. Um, obviously, the motion was made by the Leader of the Council and seconded by the Deputy Leader of the Council. Um, so, based on your recent ruling about the amendment, surely there should have been no debate after the original uh, proposal and seconding. Has this not been seconded? Amendment? No, it's not being seconded as yet. So, oh, uh, so, so it's wide open. I'm afraid you're in error there. Chair, I do also have a point of order in the chat from Councillor James Hunt as well. Councillor James Hunt, I understand you have a point of order. Thank you, Chair. Um, just considering the the amendment, it actually sounds like more like a whole new proposal than an amendment to the existing one to me. So I, I don't believe we can accept a new proposal or any slight changes and adjustments to the existing one. I'm going to take advice now from the monitoring officer and the legal advisor, because I think my decision was correct. 
and I'm going to wait for them to make some indication for me. So bear with me, please. Mr Chairman, while you're doing that, may I raise a point of order, please? Following on No, from just, just please wait. Let's sort one thing out, otherwise we're going to have so many points of order, we won't know where we are. So please just wait. Let's sort this one out, and then we can do another point of order. Chair, just to respond to your specific question, uh, I, I would certainly advise that uh, it can be allowed for consideration as a proposed amendment, since it relates to the overall one Somerset proposal and the scheduled elections. Okay. Thank but you. similarly, just to clarify for everybody else, uh, I know in terms of the point in the debate where we're at, and I know a number of members have got some other points that they would like to make in overall terms, but you're also well aware in terms of practice and procedure that when our amendments are proposed and seconded, at that point, they are then to be considered and put to the vote. Mm. Mm. And that's uh, precisely what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to pass to Scott Woodridge, to uh, to 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 run this uh, amendment through, Mr. Chair, I, I have a point of order on this amendment. Who's? Can you indicate who's calling, please? Mike Rigby, Council, sir. Council, Mike Rigby, go ahead. Yes, Mike. I, I humbly suggest that you may be in error um, in saying that the substantive motion has not been seconded. I, I distinctly remember Councillor Chilcott saying that she was seconding the motion and that she would reserve her right to speak later. So that does rather bring Councillor Bloomfield's point back into play. Yeah, I'm looking for advice on that one. She did reserve the right to speak later, as you say, and you agree. Um, which I, I would, did second I would, the motion, Chair, if that helps. <laughs> Chairman, you've also got a um, motion put forward by Councillor Huxtable uh, that the matter be put to the vote in any event. Right, so the latest, that you've probably all heard that, Councillor Huxtable's mm -hmm. come up with, he listened patiently to the debate and would like to propose the vote be put. Uh, I, I will have support of 10 members from a named vote. So... Before we get too muddled, Chairman, up I know, I know it's Chairman, I know it's down to you, but you do have new members who haven't spoken spoken on this. It would be nice to let them speak. I yeah, know but the point is, you, Adam. Yeah. The point is, Adam, that when you have a proposer for an amendment and a seconder for an amendment, that then should be that should stop me doing anything else, and I should be well, able. We to... had that right at the beginning, so you shouldn't let anyone speak. So you should do the common courtesy thing and let mm. everyone have an option to speak, as you've let some of us already speak. Well, thank you, Adam. I note your comments, but I have made a ruling on this, and we will be going to the well, vote on that. That's such a shame. Democrat, undemocratic again. Sorry. <laughs> Here on what we're voting on, are we voting on the amendment, Councillor Huxley? You're mo voting, voting, you're going to vote purely on the amendment. And uh, Councillor Leishon, will you please reread your motion of amendment? The amendment, Chair, is that Council supports the leader to make a request to the Secretary of State to defer the public consultation on the future of local government in Somerset until after the completion of the May 2021 County Council election. Thank you. Thank you. That's quite clear. And that has been seconded by Adam Dance, I believe. So, right, Scott Woodridge, please, if you'll uh, put that to the vote. Thank you, Chair. And again, members, you're, you both had that uh, amendment proposed and seconded. And Councillor Leishon's just outlined exactly what that amendment is. Uh, so I shall ask you all in alphabetical order again, whether you are in favour, whether you are against, or whether you are abstaining. So I shall start first of all with Councillor Best. Councillor Best? Oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Councillor Bloomfield? I don't see it as an amendment, but against. Councillor Bowne? Against. Councillor Broom. For. Councillor Clayton. Against. Councillor Caswell. Against. Councillor Chilcott. I do not see it as an amendment and I'm against. Councillor Clark. For an amendment. Councillor Coles. For this sensible amendment. <laughs> Councillor Dance. Obviously for its common good. Councillor Davies. Totally against. Councillor Dimery. For. Councillor Filmer. Against. Councillor Fothergill. 
can Councillor Fashini. Sorry. Councillor Fashini. Against. Councillor Govier. Abstain. Councillor Grosskop. Against. Councillor Hall. Against. Councillor Ham. Against. Councillor Healy. Against. Councillor Hewitt Cooper. Obviously against. It's just political shenanigans. Councillor James Hunt. Against. Councillor John Hunt. Abstain. Councillor Huxtable. Against. Councillor Keating. Against. Councillor Kendall. For. Councillor Lawrence. Against. Councillor Lewis. Against. Councillor Leishon. For. Councillor Jane Locke. For. Councillor Tony Locke. Councillor Tony Locke. Sorry. Abstain. Councillor Loveridge. Abstain. Councillor Munt. For. Councillor Napper. Against. Councillor Nicholson. Against. Councillor Noel. Against. Councillor Oliver. Against. Against. Councillor Parham. Against. Councillor Paul. Against. Councillor Price Anke. Paul. Councillor Pullin. Against. Councillor Purbrick. Against. Councillor Redman. Abstain. Councillor Evans. I'm for, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Rigby. For. Councillor Ruddle. I'm sorry, as a chairman of a town council, I think the procedure is wrong, so I'm going to have to abstain on this. Sorry. Councillor Taylor. <coughs> as chairman of this county council, I will abstain. Councillor Thorne, I believe, is voted against in the yeah. chat. Uh, Councillor Verdon. Against. Councillor VJ. <coughs> against. Councillor Wallace. Against. Councillor Wedderkop. Councillor Wedderkop. For. Uh, Councillor Josh Williams. The procedure's wrong. Against. Councillor Rod Williams. Against. Councillor Woodman. Against. That's why I abstained as well, but I didn't give me reason. Tony, you're not on mute. He is now. <laughs> Just to report then to the, the council in terms of the amendment, uh, 14 were for the amendment, 34 were against, and there were seven abstentions. Therefore, the motion is not carried by majority against. Chairman, we now therefore return to the substantive motion that's clearly been published with the agenda and therefore an opportunity to return to the debate on that substantive motion. The dog is in the garden next door. He's going to take your coffee. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm hearing somebody's Christine, private conversation cutting yourself, in. Please. Can you mute, please? Christine Lawrence. And Adam Dance, can you mute as well, please? Chairman, can I, Chairman, can I just clarify? I know, I know also in chat, uh, I believe Councillor Huxtable uh, also, uh, just after the amendment was proposed, uh, specifically raised uh, that he had uh, both listened patiently to the debate and proposed that the vote be put um, and that he says he has the support of 10 members 
for a name vote on that. So can I can I just check with Councillor Huxtable for clarity? Uh, was that proposal in relation to the substantive motion rather than the amendment? Uh, Scott, it was for the substantive motion. We've now cleared up the amendment. In, in which case, members, and I obviously need to advise you, you'll be aware the provisions under 4.14 of the Constitution in terms of full council rules uh, clearly state then uh, the opportunity for a member to propose and put an item to the vote, again, with the support of uh, other members. And there you have a clear name in terms of support of 10 members. It'd be useful, again, if you could just name uh, Councillor Huxtable uh, or if at least they could indicate who those members are. Chairman, can I raise another point of order, please, before you do that? Neil Bloomfield. Uh, yes, thank Neil you, Chair. I, I think when we consider what we're actually discussing here, we're discussing the creation of another authority, the abolition of five authorities, and there's all this talk about democracy. Um, we've already established that the substantive motion was proposed and seconded, and yet debate was allowed on that. Uh, and yet when the second debate, came, the amendment came up, which quite frankly, is stretching the point of amending, I would suggest. But anyway, um, I think it would be, could be seen as perhaps um, premature to curtail a debate of something of this magnitude at this point. And I do think that there should be some further debate allowed. Hear, hear on that one. Can, please, councillors, can we just say you want to speak, not start chatting in com comments from the side, uh, you know, we're not a lobby group here. I want to have democracy and I want to listen to you all. So if you say a name, I'll let you speak. But don't just shut, throw comments Tessa in Mont. from the side. Tessa Can, Mont. You didn't say anything, but I, will, I was going to come to you as the next person to speak, Councillor well, Mont. that depends on whether Councillor Huxtable thinks it's valid that I should speak. I rather well, to the removal I, of the, the ability I, to be able to raise... I'm going to, I'm going to check with the monitoring officers and, 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 and see what they say. I, I can understand feelings here um, and I'm conscious of that. Okay, Council Councillor Huxtable, the, the, the issue seems to be who are your 10 people? Could you please name the 10 councillors that are in support of your motion? Uh, Thank you, Chairman. I will I will invite 10 of my colleagues to agree the motion be put in the chat function if that will help. Thank you. Yes, that will be acceptable. And Chair, just for completeness, I can see that Councillor Rod Williams has indicated that he's seconding the motion to put the uh, substantive item okay. to the vote. I'm waiting for the 10 names then. Chair, under the under the constitution, which calls for the calling of a vote with ten named persons, surely the ten named persons should be available once that request is made, not fished around for afterwards. Could you get clarity on that, please? I'm not much of a fisherman. I'm not fishing. No, I, we're going to get into semantics here. Let's let's get on with the business of council. Um, you know, let, let's see what happens here. I understand your sentiments, Neil, but... Uh... Chairman, this is an absolute disgrace on something as important as this to the future of local government in Somerset, not to allow debate by elected members, I feel, is absolutely poor. And does this administration no favours at all? Is there nothing that you won't stoop to to hang on to power? Chairman, it is a matter that's in the Constitution that if a motion is put forward and it is supported, then that is the motion that you have to then vote on. Can, um, Chairman, I don't want to butt in, but can you... Adam, Adam, Dance, Adam Dance, you are butting in, so go ahead. Sorry. Um, Honour, I agree with what you've just said, but surely then the whole process of this morning's meeting has been followed completely wrong due to the fact that there was a debate given as soon as the as soon as we had a seconder. And I mean, surely then when we've asked for a name vote of 10 people in the past in the, the council chamber, surely it should have gone to a vote before when that's never happened before. I just think with a decision like this, my my residents of my parishes are going to be appalled if if this debate doesn't carry on. Um, 
I would, if, if I was in your boots, um, leader and chairman, I would let this debate carry on because if not, the press is just going to jump on this and I can see the headlines now. Adam, I'm going to turn to the police councillors all wait. I'm going to turn to the monitoring officer to make a comment. Please all wait. Monitoring officer. Members, uh, public uh, and others present, uh, again, just to clarify, I mean, you've already heard it from our uh, county solicitor, but again, I'll quote again from paragraph 4.14 of the council's constitution, uh, point H, which specifically states, uh, the following proposals or amendments to proposals can be proposed at a full council meeting without giving notice by asking the council to move straight to a vote on the issue being discussed otherwise known as a proposal that the question is put to the vote without delay. That is exactly what has been activated. And again, I will remind members that that particular provision has been used in the past. So there is precedent for that. Right. I'm going to turn to the leader, David Fothergill, who wishes to make a comment. I, I've got no comment to make, Chairman. I, I'm following the procedure being laid down by the country solicitor and the uh, Chairman. I think that I, I've made the position clear. We've This is about signing a letter requesting the deferral of the election. It's not our decision. It's about signing a letter. And I think that as, as the, the, cause, the vote has been called by David Huxtable, and I think he's had 10 people supporting him, then the monitoring officer will make the decision. Can we have the names, please, Chair? Yes, if you wait one, I've got to move to another screen and just see. It's, sorry, Chair, Mr. Chairman, it's John Hunt. I've got three people calling at once. John Hunt, I believe. Yes, please, Mr. Chairman. If you, if you don't mind me just saying one thing while you're, while you're waiting for these ten to be found. Um, I'm an independent... They've been, they've been, they've been found, Councillor. They have been found. And I've got the names in front of me now. I had to turn to another screen, that's all. Thank you, Mr I'll... Chairman. Can I just continue what I was saying very briefly? You can. You Thank can. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the residents I support as an independent councillor, I'm not interested in the sides here or the political wranglings. However, I would like to, on their behalf, listen to the remainder of this debate. I, I have formed an opinion, but I would like to see, I would like to hear from others for and against the signing of this letter before we continue. This is wrong. This could have happened straight after. So, for example, whatever's next on the agenda, this, this, um, Mr. Huxtable could come, Councillor Huxtable, sorry, could come forward and say, actually, let's just go straight to the vote. And then the majority will vote for that. And we won't, we will just never have a debate. This is not democratic. And I don't agree with it. Thank you for your observations. Chair. The names that you're asking for now are Councillor Mike Pullin. Councillor Graham Knoll, Councillor Mike Caswell, Councillor Gemma Verdon, Councillor William Wallace, Councillor, Councillor Anne Bowne, and Councillor Huxtable, and Councillor John Parham, and Councillor David Hall, Councillor David Nick, uh, Francis Nicholson, Councillor Mark Healy, Councillor John Woodman, Councillor Linda Vijay, Councillor Rod Williams, and... Uh, I think that's in excess of 10, so you've, you've, you've got to have the names there. Um, we've had comment from the, the, the legal advisor who says that this is a lawful stratagem. The, uh, the monitoring officer uh, is in accord with that. I think we have no other option now than to put that to the vote. Mr Chairman, I've had my hand raised for some time. I appreciate that, but I was trying to make a ruling. Um, if it's quick and if it's pertinent, Mike, it is. It will be quick. Yes, I just want to say that um, th this administration really is the gift that keeps on giving. It was going to be quite a decent uh, leaflet headline that you wanted to avoid the election, but now to say that you wanted to avoid the election without even debating it properly really is a gift. Thank you. Thank you for your observation. Um, Chair. I'm going to turn to uh, uh, the, mon the the legal advisor who wishes to say something. Chairman, I'm advising in accordance with the Constitution, and that is what the Constitution says. It is not a political issue. It is in the Constitution. I think, therefore, that my hands are effectively uh, guided by the Constitution. I have no right to go circumvent the Constitution, uh, no matter what, what my personal views might be. And therefore, I'm going to ask Scott to uh, put it to a vote. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And again, just to remind uh, both the elected members and any members of the public or press who are present, for clarity, uh, members sorry, are sorry. now being... 
Sorry, sorry, Chairman. Can I just raise a point of order that we have a member of the public who's using the public chat facility to um, issue political um, statements. Um, can we please ask that individual to defer from that or ask him to be removed from the meeting? I hope that gentleman has heard. I don't wish to name him, <coughs> but perhaps he would uh, note that comment. Chair, again, uh, just to continue that uh, clearly uh, there has been some debate on this. There has also been a proposed amendment that was not agreed. Uh, the report's been published in advance in terms of setting out the proposals together with the reasons associated with that uh, motion and the proposal, which follow on from the Council's debate uh, on this matter in July of this year. Uh, the motion and recommendation before the Council now that is being put to the vote is as follows. Uh, to request that the Secretary of State defers the County Council elections scheduled for May 2021. Uh, therefore, that uh, the Council is asked to support the leader to make a request to the Secretary of State to defer the scheduled 2021 County Council elections until such time as the Secretary of State determines to hold a County Council election as part of the transition towards a new local government structure for Somerset. That is the motion as published in advance and that is the motion that has therefore been put to the vote. So I will now move as previously yeah. to the named votes and I, I shall call members again alphabetically starting with Councillor Best if you could indicate whether you are for, against or abstaining from the motion that has been published with the agenda and papers for this meeting. Abstain. Councillor Bloomfield. I've always been for it. I'm just not happy with the guillotining of the motion, so for. Councillor Bown. Agreed. Councillor Broom. Against. Councillor Clayton. For. Councillor Caswell. For. <coughs> Councillor Chilcott. For. Councillor Clark. Abstain. Councillor Coles. Councillor Coles. Oh, vote against. Voted abstain against. Uh, Councillor Garn. Chair, oh, my apologies. Oh, my apologies. Councillor Against. Garn. Against. Councillor Davies. For. Councillor Dimmery. Against. Councillor Filmer. For. Councillor Fothergill. <laughs> For Councillor Fraschini. For Councillor Govia. Abstain. Councillor Grosskop. Councillor Grosskop. For Councillor Hall. For Councillor Ham. For Councillor Healy. For Councillor Hewitt Cooper. For Councillor James Hunt. For. Councillor John Hunt. Abstain. Councillor Huxtable. For. Councillor Keating. For. Councillor Kendall. Against. Councillor Lawrence. For. Councillor Lewis. For. Councillor Leishon. Against. Councillor Jane Lock. Against. Councillor Tony Lock. Abstain. Councillor Loveridge. Abstain. Councillor Munt. Against. Councillor Napper. Happy. For. Councillor Nicholson. For. Councillor Knoll. For. Councillor Oliver. For. Councillor Parham. For. Councillor Paul. For. Councillor Pryor Sanke. Okay. Councillor Pullin. Four. Councillor Purbrick. Four. Councillor Redman. Abstain. Councillor Evans. Against. Councillor Rigby. <laughs> Against. <laughs> Councillor Ruddle. I think through the lack of debate, I'm going to have to abstain. Sorry. Councillor Taylor. As chairman, I'm abstaining. 
Councillor Thorne has voted for. Councillor Verdon? Four. Four. Councillor VJ? Four. Councillor Wallace? Four. Councillor Wedderkop? Again. Councillor Josh Williams? Four. Councillor Rod Williams? Four. Councillor Woodman? Four. Point of order, Chair. Person calling for a co point of order. Can you identify, please? Councillor, Councillor Woodman. John Woodman. Councillor Woodman, go ahead. Um, isn't it normal for the chairman's vote to be taken at the end in case the in case the voting is close, rather than in alphabetical order in these circumstances? In these circumstances, the chairman decided to uh, abstain. I think that answers your question, Councillor Woodman. No, I'm just talking about the order. So if it was equal, you'd have the casting vote. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a nod from the legal advisor. If it was equal. Only if it was equal. Yes, Chair. So therefore, if you were at the end, then you would have that casting vote. If you do it halfway through, you wouldn't know. I'm told that that's not a point of order, Councillor Woodman. Thank you. And, My apologies, Chairman. And, and, and the monitoring officer did stress that it was done in alphabetical order. I now ask the monitoring officer to read out the result of that vote, please. Thank you, Chair. So the, uh, the results of those votes are in favour, 34, against 12, abstain, 9. Therefore, the substantive motion is carried and agreed by majority. Right. I think it would be an opportune time that we'd put on here at the start that we would break for lunch or for a half an hour break at 12.50. It is 12.48, so I think it's an opportune time to stop now for that half an hour break. And uh, perhaps if you could all be back in here by... Uh, 20 past one, please. I say all back in here, but if you could all come back online, it seems there's only three of us or four of us in here. Thank you.
James. No, no, sorry, James. I'm, I just was making sure that I, we couldn't do anything in this room until we had Jane Locke had rejoined us, and she has now. Oh. So I'm giving Nigel, her a chance to switch on the machine. Nigel, I thought you were outside County Hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you notice the lack of traffic going past me there? Do you? <laughs> We're in the middle of the road. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Yeah. And the lack of wind. Yeah, and, and yeah. Gamsa Pulling came up and pushed me on at least two occasions. Anyway, you're good. You're doing a very good job in the circumstances. You're right, John Clark. I'm fine. Shame they made you sit outside on the pavement, Sir <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> I think that was your idea, Councillor Hall. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll run through everybody in a minute and ask them to put their hands up again. Are you in the lateral room, Nigel? I can't tell you. I'd have to. I'd have to eat you if I told you, Mrs. Chilcote. <laughs> Just wondering. It's a secret. A need to know basis. Yeah, that need to know basis. Thank you, Mr. Keating. <laughs> I'm bottom of the queue then. No, 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 no. No, I'm surrounded by giant screens on one side, a little screen in front of me, another screen to my right, and somebody somebody wrote in, why does he keep looking down? Why is he looking sideways? Well, you've got to to try and monitor the meeting. You've got to be fair and you know, see who's calling. So we are coming up to 13.21, so we, we should be now starting. Um, I'm going to ask everybody, if you're online, please indicate. Just put your hands up so we can see that all the councillors are in here, please. Could you all please put your hand up as if you're asking a question? We can see if we've got everybody here. Okay, Lee Redman, Mike Pullin, Mike Best, Peter Burridge Clayton, Anna Groskop. Phil, Phil Ham, you're not with us yet, Mandy Chilcote, David Huxtable, John Woodman, Mike Lewis, Mark Keating, John per Faye Perbrick, Rod Williams. Chairman, if it, if it helps again, just for everyone's benefit, the, the meeting's currently quorum. There are more than 14 members who are indicating that they are present. Okay. Therefore, you are able to start the meeting. Okay. Chairman, may I, may I just say one thing? If you're looking to the left and the right and the middle, then this is a democratic uh, decision what we're making. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Knapper. Only you would come up with that observation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right. Councillor Fothergill has now joined us. I believe most of you have indicated. If you'd be kind enough to put your hands down, or you have had your hands put down, I think. So, right. I'm going to start now with paper A. Chair, um, Roger Hapgood is in the lobby waiting to come in and has been for some time. Yeah, he came in, then went out again. So I, I, I will see if um, we can he's, admit him. He's there. So he's, he's been there for quite a while. I just wonder still, if someone could sort him out. OK, that will be done. Can you do that, please? Oh. He's just, he's just right, that's going to be done. Chair. OK. Right. Well, as I was saying, um, paper A is the climate change paper. And I'm going to ask David Fothergill as the proposer to make an introductory speech and summarise the key points from papers A and B. And you'll find these on pages 33 to 190. Sorry, I'll remove my mask now. I'm back in here. <coughs> Requesting that members have due regard to the Equalities Impact Assessment. Uh, Councillor Fothergill will propose and Councillor Paul will second. And at the end of that, I will I invite a debate on an amendment. So, Councillor Fothergill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Um, and uh, it gives me a great, great pleasure really to propose this paper. I think that uh, an incredible amount of work has been uh, put into this paper, not only by uh, county staff, but by district staff, everyone working together. Uh, and uh, I think that it is a paper that I would really commend. Um, I guess for some people that they would like to see it go further and I understand that and I, I, I think that at some point we will have to go further um, but uh, for the paper that's presented I think it is a tremendous uh, tremendous foundation and I will uh, hope that people do fully support it. But the person that's going to properly introduce it is Claire Paul and I'm going to hand now to Claire who will also second it as part of her proposal. 
Councillor Paul. Thank you very much, Chair. Indeed, um, I'm delighted to second this and thank you very much, uh, Leader. Um, fellow members, I'm really proud and pleased to be recommending to you the Climate Emergency Strategy for Somerset. For many of us who've already been closely involved with the development of this, today is not an introduction to it, more a personal heartfelt plea from me for each of you for active support for this great bit of work. I do hope everyone will join me in thanking the Somerset County Council officers and indeed the officers from across the five authorities, as well as a significant number of partner organisations for their time and commitment in undertaking this volume of work, especially through what has been and continues to be a difficult time for us all. I'd like to thank elected members that made up the Cross Authority Task and Finish Group for their really valuable contributions, providing direction and advice to those working on the strategy. And lastly, of course, to thank the portfolio holders responsible for climate change. Our strategy is the product of a year's worth of research, evidence building, consultation, challenge, expert deliberation and input. It's been a difficult task, but one that has been taken with enthusiasm and diligence. Through our public consultation, we have ensured local people could give their opinions and we have helped communities to understand our ambitions and plans and encouraged everyone to commit to doing their bit to help us tackle the impacts of climate change. Towards a climate resilient Somerset has been through scrutinies, many task and finish group meetings, the executive meetings of some authorities, through the chief executives and leaders, and is presented here for us now at our full council for your consideration. We have before us something that has been developed with the support and input and advice from a huge range of climate experts, sector experts, local interest groups and communities made up of both young and old and is an evidence-based strategy. It is not a gut feel, speculative, opinion-based document, but one that has been informed by internationally and nationally accepted data and facts. It has been subject to challenge from a number of critical friends who have helped us shape it and given us the benefit of their considerable knowledge and understanding. It has taken into consideration a range of very different and opposing points or principles and views. Indeed, some of you may not entirely agree with some of the conclusions or the proposed direction of travel, but the evidence does speak for itself. My hope is that we will all get behind this, become ambassadors for our strategy, understand what we are trying to achieve, sign up to the outcomes we have as aspirations and sign up to the commitments we all must make, the lifestyle changes residents of Somerset can make and help lead by example and help spread the message to get as many involved as possible. Somerset is a beautiful county that has an abundance of natural resources at its disposal to help plan for and mitigate against climate change. A low carbon future will be a positive way for Somerset providing a thriving green economy and with hopefully nature some way to being restored. Let's get together, raise the profile, look at these shared opportunities, look at the challenges we face in front of us and all take some action. I really am so chuffed to have had the privilege of being part of this dynamic and well thought through strategy and want to move on to the important part, its implementation. Our tactical plans will come next, so please get behind our strategy towards a climate resilient Somerset as our starting point so that we can collectively crack on. And I ask you to join me in taking our living, breathing strategy forward, help preserve defend and improve our environment, the air we breathe, our health and well-being, our quality of life and ability to exist and thrive for the future 
and for future generations. And I would ask that this strategy is formally adopted by this council and a nod for Michelle, whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Paul, for your impassioned uh, presentation. Um, I'm now going to uh, move down. I see Michelle Cusack is querying, but I have it on the notes here to invite debate on the amendment. Uh, I, I see a number Sorry, of Chairman. hands up, which I see is Bill Revens, Liz Leishon, Graham Knoll and John Clark. Um, uh, I, I will take those first and then we'll see about this amendment. So, Bill Revens, please. Uh, apologies, Mr Chairman, mine was a legacy hand. I've removed it now. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, John Clark. Councillor Clark, is that yes. a le legacy you, hand? Uh, no, it was certainly not a legacy hand. Um, I just wanted to make a brief statement, ask a couple of questions, and thank you, Claire, for, uh, for, for her comments. And I fully agree that we need to crack on and take real action. Um, we are facing, I feel, um, and experiencing, in some regards, a climate and ecological emergency. Uh, scientists have said that we are in a state of planetary emergency. The risk and urgency of the situation are acute, and we need to act now. Perhaps I should put my video on, sorry. Um, the State of Nature 2019 report highlighted the impact of climate change and the critical decline in biodiversity in the UK. 15% of UK species are classified as threatened with extinction and 2% are already extinct. This is, this is the situation we face. So Somerset Green Party County Councillors support the Somerset Climate Change Strategy, but with some serious reservations. The strategy is an aspirational document, an initial step in the right direction. We are on a journey and this is the start of that journey. And as Claire was saying, we must applaud all the efforts and work that has gone into this strategy. It's a robust and clear and very um, evidence-based document, and that's to be applauded. However, it fails to grasp the urgency of the, the action required and the scale of changes to be made to achieve the target of net carbon Somerset by 2030. Not a low carbon future, a net carbon future. There's a real need for greater leadership, action and urgency from government, as well as a green recovery from COVID. With more jobs in home installation, renewable energy, transforming, transforming transport, restoring nature, recycling and health, healthier lifestyles. And some of those areas have already been pursued, particularly around recycling, which is to be applauded also. We need to build back better to create an economy and communities that are fair, sustainable and resilient. We must build for a lasting green recovery and green economy. The stronger, more radical approach is needed. Any review and monitoring arrangements through the outline governance body must be at pace and reflect the urgency that is required to reach the target of zero carbon by 2030. It is essential to work with our communities, but the Somerset strategy appears to pass too much responsibility for solutions to communities and individuals. Statements such as it is ultimately Somerset's residents and the everyday, everyday choices they make that will have the biggest impact. Demonstrates that this approach, whilst the public consultation gives a contrasting view, it was quoted, the real power to act lies with business, industry and government. However, individually and as communities, we can make great contributions and must do so. But this is only likely to achieve so much without effective government backing. I applaud this Somerset County Council who have taken the lead in establishing a climate emergency grant fund. This must continue to provide the support needed by town, city and parish councils to work in their communities to take action to mitigate climate change. The strategy needs to include information about councils' commitments to ring fence funds to facilitate and enable actions to take place in their, on their own assets. For example, funding to ensure that all schools have investment for energy efficiency measures, the planting of trees and tiny forests, protecting and restoring our peatland, investment in public transport and active travel, EV charging, and lastly, renewable energy products in Somerset. Somerset cannot make the changes alone. Central government has a responsibility to bring forward the right national policies and economic frameworks. 
And I note today they have announced bringing forward the, the ceasing of petrol and diesel uh, cars to 2030. Until this government wakes up fully to the urgency of the situation, we must deal head on with the challenges we face. Uh, that, that's my statement, but I would like a response from either the leader or Claire at some point around the specific questions regarding the review and monitoring arrangements. And also, uh, will we see a commitment from the, from the council again to ring fence funds to facilitate and enable actions around mitigating climate change as they, as they did in the last this current financial year? Thank you, Chair. Uh, would you be content if um, Councillor Paul gives you a written reply to that? I wouldn't mind a brief verbal reply. I did. I did forward this to. Okay. Clear. Okay. If it's if it's brief, because we've got a lot of business to go, and we're only halfway through. So, okay. Councillor Paul. Yeah, if, if I'm happy to, of course, to John. Response, then I would welcome it. If not, a written answer would be appreciated. No, okay, of you. course, John. I'll give a very quick one, Chair. John, thank you so much for supporting the strategy. Um, of course, we're fully aware of the urgency of this. Uh, hence, even why during you know COVID, we've we've pressed on, we've listened to our communities, and uh, you know one of the things that our communities said was to go on to the second without the second consultation and and simply just to get on with this at pace so we can uh, start implementing some of the things we want to do. Yes, there's the proposed formal governance. Uh, an oversight structure of it going forwards. Um, this is, of course, one of the things you mentioned about commitment to it. This is, of course, why the leader of this council gave the one million climate fund as well. That can help uh, support projects across uh, Somerset. Um, and as we've stated, it's, it's really down to all of us to show and demonstrate leadership on this. But of course, John, I will come back to you with a full and frank response. Thank you, Councillor Paul, and thank you, John, for your uh, your comments. Thank you. Uh, Dave Leverage, your hands up. Councillor Dave yeah, thank Leverage. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I support this fully. Um, uh, and I think that we should also make more representation at local level, i.e. planning. Um, where car housing planning authority should be making the developers put in electric charging points. We should be putting charging points all over the town. We could also look at little bylaws. In Bridgewater, I've noticed that, especially now the colder weather's coming, couples are driving in, parking up, the wife goes in the shop, and the, car, and the husband's out there, or the wife, vice versa, sit there with the engine idling. This engine idling is causing a lot of pollution in the towns. And it's little bylaws like that that we should be taking by the neck and saying, look, you will abide by the laws. You will not idle with your car engine running all the time. And, and, and we should be looking at developers, uh, eco-friendly houses, i.e. climate control. All houses should be climate controlled and all houses should have adequate parking. Sorry, Chairman, I could go on all day, but that'll do for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Bob Filmer and then Councillor Jane Locke. No, sorry, Chair. May I just, I'll be very brief, really, I will. Um, you will, Councillor Paul, you will. Thank you so much, but I just wanted to touch on that. Um, this morning's green recovery announced really did hit on that electric car um, situation and, of course, with our planning, our building our homes. So that's all in there. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Um, Councillor Bob Filmer. Thank you, Chairman. Just wanted to also uh, echo the comments that we made in supporting this this strategy. Um, as a, a member of the Task and Finish Group, it, it was a pleasure to work with officers, members, and members of the public in in helping to put together this this strategy. And I think it's noticeable that it was cross party. It was across the five councils, all working together and with outside bodies. Um, there were a huge range of, of views and concerns, and I think it's been a, a, a real credit to to all all of those who helped to bring those views together into what ultimately is is a pragmatic and achievable strategy that that we can we can take forward. I think hearing the comments that were made earlier, it is very much that this has to be a living document. I'm sure it will evolve over time as as issues are addressed uh, and other issues crop up. So. Very happy to, to support this and hope that members will also be able to uh, give their endorsement to this strategy going forward. 
Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jane Locke. Thank you, Chair. Um, a question for Claire, uh, please. Um, Claire, I, I, I too welcome the announcement today by the government to phase out um, petrol and diesel cars um, by or the, the purchase of new di petrol and diesel cars by uh, within the next 10 years or so. Um, I, I'm just wondering um, how on track Somerset County Council is to replace their vehicles. I do remember proposing that some of the smaller waste, new waste vehicles that were being purchased was actually voted down um, and not uh, that, that idea was not taken forward by um, the administration here. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned that some of the money or the funding that will be for uh, green projects may need to be diverted to make sure that Somerset County Council can, conf can fulfil its commitments um, and move in a, a timely fashion. Um, and of course, I'm sure we all think that the idea of gas guzzling cars is, is a thing of the past um, and it's time we all moved on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Locke. Councillor Fothergill. Oh, sorry. Oh. I asked Claire, but that's fine. Oh, I beg your pardon, but I was... Uh, <laughs> I uh, in for uh, David. Councillor Fothergill was trying to nudge me to my right here from the distance. Um, Jane, so. thank you ever so much for that. Of course, the uh, pool of cars and vehicles are being currently reviewed literally at the moment as we um, speak. And you, you'll probably recall Derek on the uh, Waste Partnership has been going on about it. So, you know, he's very keen to keep me pushing forward on this as well. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Now I am going to turn to Councillor Fothergill. Thank you very much. And I would just like to come back to Jane. I suppose it refers as well to something that um, uh, John Clark was saying earlier. Um, it will be a struggle to spend more money in this area. And, and absolutely, because we will need to set a balanced budget. We've got lots of priorities that we need to tackle. Uh, and lots of things that we need to do uh, and the best way that we can spend money in this area is by releasing cash which is currently being spent on running councils so i hope in future they'll support the one somerset business case which releases 18 and a half million pound a year to be able to spend in exactly these areas thank you councillor fothergill i'm looking to see if there's any more hands up i've got nobody at the moment indicating they wish to speak if there is someone that i haven't seen or can't see on the board please indicate I'm not seeing anybody. I'm not seeing anybody indicate. Right. Well, that is your debate. Um, and now I must invite debate on the amendment. Uh, uh, right. I don't think there is an amendment, Chair. Okay, so it's being withdrawn then, is it? It's on here. It's on my chairman's notes. Invite debate on amendment. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll ignore that. I'm having a senior moment, albeit it's written in front of me. So I'm going to invite council members, having asked your questions and make statements. Councillor Fothergill has answered any questions. So I'm going to refer members to the recommended recommendations to vote upon. And I'm going to ask the monitoring officer to read out the names for members uh, to them vote accordingly. So it's councillor, uh, sorry, it's um, the monitoring officer. Please. Scott Woodridge. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and again, the uh, motion put before the Council is set out in the uh, report that's been uh, published in advance. That motion is that the Council is recommended to adopt towards a climate resilient Somerset, Somerset's climate emergency strategy. I will now read out uh, councillors' names in alphabetical order. If you could indicate when your name is uh, uh, when, when your name is said, whether you are in favour, against or abstain. And I shall start first of all with Councillor Best. Four. Councillor Bloomfield. Looks like he's left the meeting. Councillor Bowne. Four. Councillor Broom. Four. Councillor Clayton. Four. Councillor Caswell. Four. Councillor Chilcott. Four. Councillor Clark. Uh, Councillor Clark. Oh, uh, is that me? Yes. Um, yes. Um, four. Councillor Coles. <laughs> four. Councillor Dance. Four. Councillor Davies.
Four. Councillor Dimmering. Four. Councillor Filmer. Four. Councillor Fothergill. Yes, four. Councillor Fraschini. Four. Councillor Govio. Four. Councillor Grosskop. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Ham. Four. Councillor Healy. Councillor Healy. He uh, doesn't argue on the present. Councillor Hewitt Cooper. He may have dropped off the line, I'm afraid. He, he's not on the call either. <laughs> Councillor James Hunt. Four. Councillor John Hunt. Four. Councillor Huxtable. Four. Councillor Keating. Four. Councillor Kendall. Councillor Kendall. Four. Councillor Lawrence. Four. Councillor Lewis. Four. Councillor Leishon. Four. Councillor Jane Locke. Four. Councillor Tony Locke. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Munt. Four. Councillor Napper. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Noel. Four. Councillor Oliver. Four. Councillor Parham. It's got the uh, Councillor Parham's pop. Put in the chat. I, I lost my broadband connection during that uh, debate, so I won't vote. Unable to vote. Councillor Paul. Four. Councillor Prior Sankey. Four. Councillor Pullin. Four. Councillor Purbrick. Four. Councillor Redman. Happily four. Councillor Evans. Four, please. Councillor Rigsby. Four. Councillor Ruddell. Councillor Ruddle. Sorry, Chair, you had connection problems. Uh, yeah, four. Councillor Thorne, I see, has voted four. Councillor Verdon. Four. Councillor VJ. <coughs> Councillor VJ. To leave the meeting. Councillor Wallace. Four. Councillor Weddercock. Four. Councillor Josh Williams. Four. Councillor Rod Williams? Four. Councillor Woodman? Four. That motion is carried by majority, Chair. Good sorry. news. Sorry sorry to interrupt, Chair and Scott. Can I just confirm whether Councillor Ruddle is on the call? Uh, Chair, uh, Chair, Chair, again, just, just to clarify, I can see in the chat that Councillor Huxtable has, uh, has similarly asked in terms of for clarification around whether this was a name vote. Again, um, just to clarify that this is one of the standard votes and not a name vote. The only reason I'm calling out people's names is purely because we're in a virtual meeting, so it allows us to record and track exactly how the voting is. But it is <coughs> not a named vote. No, that that's fine. I, I don't believe Councillor Ruddle's on the call, and yet some there was a noise of vote after his name. So just need to bear that in mind when tallying votes. Can I ask a question, please? Who's calling, please? I can't remember what the question was. Councillor Woodman. Yeah. Councillor Woodman. I can't remember what the question was. I was just about to ask a question about what David Huxtable said, but uh, just to clarify something. That was all. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, a little while ago, at the, one of the last four council meetings, um, Scott said that every vote is like a named vote because it's virtual. And now it seems there are two distinctive different ways of voting. One's a name vote, one's just a virtual vote. Can you just clear that up for me? Are the votes recorded? I'm and have ask, they been recorded in the past or not? I'm going to ask Scott to answer that. He's uh, ready. Again, just for clarity again, um, a named vote is a specific provision in the Constitution which requires uh, 11 members uh, within the meeting to request that a name vote is taken. In that instance, each member's name is called in turn. The record of those votes is reported in the minutes and recorded as such. Uh, however, for virtual meetings, in this instance, just to aid public transparency and accuracy, uh, there is also, when we vote normally, I will just be calling members alphabetically, and that's solely for the purpose of ensuring we have an accurate tally of the votes. That is not what is known as a named vote. 
<clears throat> okay, I think that's cleared up uh, any questions. So I'm now going to move to the Treasury Management Mid-Year Report 2020 to 21. That's paper B. And I'm going to invite Councillor Mandy Chilcott to introduce the item and speak as the proposer. Councillor Mandy Chilcott. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as councillors would have noted, this report is for information only. And it gives a summarised account of Treasury Management activity and outturn for the first half of the year, this year and it ensures that Somerset County Council is embracing best practice in accordance with the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, or SIPFA as we uh, so fondly know them. You will see from the report that the coronavirus pandemic was a major driver of markets during the period under review. Ultra low interest rates have been seen with the yield on some short dated UK government bonds remaining negative. Somerset County Council's cash flow has also been volatile, with large amounts of government COVID grant and enhanced levels of LEP grant income. The capital spend has also seen some slippage. This council's gross investment balances stood at 255 million on the 30th of September, and this figure includes approximately 53.65 million of cash managed on behalf of the local enterprise partnership, and £11.3 million pounds of earmarked reserves held on behalf of other decision-making bodies. You'll see from the report that income net of external bodies monies was 764,924 against the anticipated income of 1.3 million. This council has again adopted a passive borrowing strategy, borrowing funds only if they are required. I am happy and pleased to confirm that no new borrowing has been taken during the period and it's not currently envisaged that any will be taken in the second half of the financial year. At the midpoint, 1.35 million of budgeted new borrowing costs have not been incurred and this figure more than offsets the reduction we've seen in investment income. In line with the Treasury Management Strategy for 2021, Somerset County Council was looking to invest in other pooled funds during the early part of 2021, but the volatility in markets warranted a postponement. As relative stability is now returned to the market, suitable investments will once again be appraised and investment into a short dated bond fund is due to be made. All Treasury activities undertaken have been in full compliance with relevant legislation, codes, strategies, policies and practices. So in conclusion, I'd like to propose the recommendation that the Council endorse the Treasury Management Mid-Year Outturn Report for 1920. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Chilcott. I'm now going to invite the seconder, Councillor Liz Lejon, to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, reading this report and understanding it as well as I am able, I think it should go to the archive because it is a quite remarkable record of the financial position of 2020. And I would draw your attention to page 200 where uh, it's recorded the Bank of England maintained the bank rate at 0.1% and its quantitative easing programme at 745 billion pounds. It is, I've, I've no idea whether anyone has ever seen a report at any council like this before, uh, but I commend those officers at the County Council who are doing a really good job in looking after the monies and taking the approach they are on internal borrowing in order to reduce the costs of external borrowing while we go through this and even with the slippage that we're seeing in the capital program so i'm very happy to second this uh, and add my thanks to all the officers who are working so hard thank you thank you councillor legislation i'm now going to invite council members to speak i'm looking for hands up and at the moment, there are no hands up. Therefore, I'm going to invite uh, Councillor Chilcott, uh, Mandy Chilcott, or Jason Vaughan to answer any questions. Well, there are no questions raised. Therefore, I'm going to refer members to the recommendations to vote upon. 
and the monitoring officer will deal with that. Thank you, Chair. And again, uh, same format as the uh, as the previous item. Uh, there is not a named vote. Uh, that has not been requested. Nevertheless, I shall be calling out members in alphabetical order just so I can again record uh, for the purposes of, a, of an overall uh, tally exactly what the total vote is. So, should I start first of all with Councillor Best in terms Four. of the recommendation? Four. Councillor Bloomfield? <laughs> it's left. Councillor Bowne? Four. Councillor Broom? Four. Councillor Clayton? Four. Councillor Caswell? Four. Councillor Chilcott? Four. Councillor Clark? Yes, I vote four, but in the hope that we no longer invest in fossil fuels. Thank you. Councillor Coles? Four. Councillor Dance? Four. Councillor Davies? Four. Councillor Dimery? Four. Councillor Filmer? Four. Councillor Fothergill? Four. Councillor Fraschini? Four. Councillor Govier? Four. Councillor Grosskop? Four. Councillor Hall? Four. Councillor Ham? Four. Councillor Healy? Left the meeting. Councillor Hewitt Cooper? Left, left, left the, the meeting. meeting. Councillor James Hunt? Four. Councillor John Hunt? Four. Councillor Huxtable? Four. Councillor Keating? Four. Councillor Kendall? Four. Councillor Lawrence? Four. Councillor Lewis? Four. Councillor Lachon? Four. Councillor Jane Locke? Four. Councillor Tony Locke? Four. Councillor Loveridge? Four. Councillor Munt? Four. Councillor Napper? Four. Councillor Nicholson? Four. Councillor Noel? Councillor Knowles? Four. Four. Councillor Oliver? Four. Councillor Parham? Four. Councillor Paul? Four. Councillor Price Anke? Four. Councillor Pullin? Four. Councillor Purbrick? Four. Councillor Redmond? Four. Councillor Evans? Four, please. Councillor Rigby? Councillor Rigby? Councillor Rigby? Four. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ruddle? Left the meeting. Uh, Councillor Taylor? Four. Councillor Thorne? We voted yes. I voted four on the chat. Councillor Verdon? Four. Councillor VJ? Left the meeting. Left. Councillor Wallace? Yeah, four. Councillor Weddercott? Four. Councillor Josh Williams? Four. Councillor Rod Williams? Four. Councillor John Woodman? Four. Again, that motion is carried by majority and therefore agreed. Thank you. Now it uh, behoves me to move to item nine. This is the report of the monitoring officer. So I'm going to turn to Scott and ask him to uh, reveal his report, please. Your chair and again just for the uh, the benefit of uh, both members but also members of the public if i could just ask uh, politely if any members uh, wish to speak at any point either at this report or any other reports uh, if, if again you could uh, switch your video on not at the point of voting but just where you're asking questions that's principally because i know in, to, in addition to the teams meeting that's been run today there's also a live youtube broadcast uh, similar to what we did in july and i know that we have a number of members of the public who, uh, who do have some hearing difficulties and they benefit from being able to visually see people as well in terms of lip reading. So and if I could just uh, just make that point. Uh, turning to my report, it, it's, a, it's a standard report that you're used to seeing at most of these meetings. It relates to procedural matters, principally where there are any changes in terms of committee appointments or uh, specific roles within the council. Uh, you'll know that uh, certainly those are set out in terms of Appendix 1. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, Appendix 1 was updated uh, on Monday evening. Uh, to include a number of uh, proposed changes from the Liberal Democrat group. And again, those proposed changes have been circulated to all members and they're published on the web on our website. And those changes are shown in red uh, for ease of reference. Uh, 
so that members can see those uh, those changes to uh, the various committee appointments. Uh, you will also see, certainly in terms of recommendation two, uh, uh, recognition uh, both to uh, Councillor Graham Knoll, who served as the chair of Pensions Committee for many years, uh, but a specific uh, proposal then uh, regarding the appointment of Councillor John Thorne as the chair of uh, Pensions Committee. So that's the, those are the proposals relating to committee appointments and some proposed changes from the political groups. Uh, you'll also then notice there are two uh, matters relating to statutory posts. Uh, one is, again, a reflection of uh, ensuring the council has resilience throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you'll know that most statutory post holders have a deputy designated. Those deputies come into play should the substantive post holder become ill or be absent for any reason. Um, and therefore, the, the deputy then is empowered to act on their behalf. Uh, you'll notice, therefore, there are two uh, well, there's a proposal there in terms of a deputy scrutiny officer. And then there's a further proposal in terms of an appointment of the council's data protection officer. <coughs> and the final matter that's set out in my report for today uh, relates to an update regarding the scrutiny review. Members will remember uh, that we brought forward proposals uh, following the work that was undertaken with the Centre for Public Scrutiny the involvement, consultation, engagement with the three scrutiny committees and with the full support also of both Constitution and Standards and the Cabinet regarding a series of uh, <coughs> improvements uh, that were set out in that review report back in January. One of the undertakings back then, uh, and it's only uh, 10 months ago, uh, was that we provide a further report back to Council at this meeting just in terms of an assurance about what progress has made. Uh, clearly, we've had the benefit of reporting on progress to the three scrutiny committees ahead of Council today. And again, the, the report speaks for itself in the sense that even in the wake and the, and the challenge of uh, completing a number of those recommendations during the global pandemic and working remotely, that uh, progress has nevertheless been made and also gives an update in terms of the further work that's scheduled uh, for the remainder of this financial year. And at that point, Chair, I'm uh, happy to take any questions that members may have. OK, I'm looking at the screen to see if there's any questions from any member. And it doesn't appear as if we do have any questions, so I think that's rather fortunate. Um, so you've you've heard the report and basically um, I think we just take that for noting, isn't it? No, sorry. No, sorry, no, Chair, David Fothergill. I didn't report the decision, I believe Councillor Fothergill is uh, due to propose the, uh, the your recommendations. Pardon. Beg your pardon. Councillor Fothergill. Thank you very much indeed, Chair and thank you to the monitoring officer as well uh, i don't propose to say very much actually because um i fully support all of the uh, all of the um, recommendations that are in front of us I, I would just like to say a few words about graham Knoll, though because graham is standing down um, from chairing the pensions committee after a, a good many years and i know that he's he's been involved in it uh, uh, quite extensively so I, I would like to pay tribute for the role that graham has played um, I, in another life i'm also a trustee of a pension scheme um, and i know that it can be really difficult um, just understanding uh, the legalities and, uh, and the requirements and you're always conscious conscious that you're looking after other people's uh, other people's retirement um, and it's, it's not an easy job but equally it's not a job that's uh, that's recognized uh, uh, by by many, it's often seen as an under the radar job. That it's it's, it's really backroom. Um, but it's, I think for for all of our employees and for all those pensioners, it is a really, really important job. And uh, I would like to pay tribute to to Graham. He's done the job diligently, um, professionally, uh, and I think he's shown full commitment commitment to it. And and when he wrote to me and said that he'd like to step down because it was by his request, um, then I, I, I've got to admit that I was uh, a little disappointed. I gave Gave him a number of days and a few more days and a few more days to think about it um but he was uh, he was fairly made up in his mind but i i would just like to pay tribute to the work that he has done um to the good state that he leaves the pension scheme uh, and i would like to to thank him and to wish john thorne the very best um i know he's got some big shoes to fill with graham um but i'm sure that he'll do the job the job um really well so thank you to graham and good luck to john Councillor Graham Knoll, I see your hands up. Uh, yes, thank you, um, 
Thank you for those kind words, David. Um, I would like to record my tribute to the officers and staff who have helped me during my period as uh, chairman, for, uh, both in Taunton and Ex Exeter, Peninsula Pensions, for them, all their sterling work. Um, thanks particularly to Anton Sweet, who I found to be a most knowledgeable, competent and helpful manager. Um, he, he, will, he, he does a very good job. Best wishes to John, and I'm sure he's going to enjoy himself as a pension chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Noel. Councillor Jane Locke, as the seconder to speak. Yes, Chairman, thank you. I'm happy to second um, the report of the monitoring officer um, and just to take this opportunity to thank Scott for looking after us so well this year. Um, he's always there for support and advice when we need it, and we very much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Locke. Right, in that case, we're going to move it to the vote, and it's going to be the unusual position of the monitoring officer organising the vote on his report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, obviously, a vote by the Council. Um, so, again, I shall follow the same format. You already have the five recommendations uh, set out in the papers before you, uh, so I'm not going to refer to those or read them out, but I shall start again in alphabetical order, and initially I shall start with uh, Councillor Bespro. I note as well earlier on that Councillor Thorne uh, did declare a prejudicial interest in this item and clearly won't be voting in terms of this matter. Uh, but if I start initially with Councillor Best. Four. Uh, Councillor Bloomfield, I believe, has left the meeting. Councillor Bowne. Yes. Councillor Broom. Four. Councillor Clayton. Four. Councillor Caswell. Four. Councillor Chilcott. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Coles. Four. Councillor Dance. Four. Councillor Davies. Four. Councillor Dimmering. Four. Councillor Filmer. Four. Councillor Fothergill. Four. Councillor Fraschini. Four. Councillor Govia. Four. Councillor Grosscott. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Ham. Four. I believe Councillors Healy and Hewitt Cooper are at the meeting. <laughs> Councillor James Hunt. Four. Councillor John Hunt. Four. Councillor Huxtable. Four. Councillor Keating. Four. Councillor Kendall. Four. Councillor Lawrence. Four. Councillor Lewis. Four. Councillor Leishon. Sorry, four. Councillor Jane Lock. Four. Councillor Tony Lock. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Munt. Four. Councillor Napa. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Noll. Four. Councillor Oliver. Four. Councillor Parham. Four. Councillor Paul. Four. Councillor Pryasanke. Four. Councillor Pullin. Four. Councillor Purbrick. Four. Councillor Redmond. Four. Councillor Revens. Four, please. Councillor Rigby. Four. Councillor Ruddle. Please left the meeting. Councillor Taylor. Four. Councillor Verdon. Four. Councillor VJ. Please left the meeting. Councillor Wallace. Councillor Wallace. Uh, four, sorry, yeah. Councillor Weddercott. Yes. Four. Councillor Councillor Josh Williams. Four. Councillor Rod Williams. Four. Councillor Woodman. Four. And again, just for the record, again, that all those recommendations are carried by majority and therefore are agreed. Thank you, Mr Woodridge. I move to item 10. That's the report of the Joint Independent Remuneration Panel, Parental Leave and Carers Allowances. And you'll find the notes to this on pages 227 to 238. I'm going to uh, give a warm welcome to John Thompson, who I'm hoping is here, who is the chair of the Joint Independent Remuneration Panel. Mr Thompson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
as you um as as you said my name is john thompson and i am chair of the independent remuneration panel um as the uh, word uh, uh, expresses independent is what we are and our um, aim is to provide uh, recommendations to the council on members allowances but they are just recommendations and it is up to the uh, council to see whether they agree or disagree with those recommendations. We normally um, carry out a four yearly review of allowances, a fundamental review, um, but last year we were asked by the council to look for specifically council leave and carers allowances. I first deal with um, parental leave. Um, this is an area where Somerset is actually leading the way. Um, we did a, a short survey of peer authorities uh, on this subject uh, in the summer, and there were only three authorities that had uh, a, a policy in place, one of which was Somerset, although others are looking at the subject. Um, the um, the thing about um, parental leave is uh, uh, that it uh, covers periods uh, of um, uh, adoption and uh, maternity. Um, there uh, was a decision made by the council uh, that uh, during periods of um, parental leave, uh, the um, uh, council would continue to uh, pay basic allowances. And this is something that uh, the panel felt was important. Um, the, um, one of the concerns uh, is always that when people first stand for election, uh, they um, are not put off from standing by uh, the income uh, that they may or may not receive um, both through their employment and uh, through um, allowances from the council. And so therefore, um, it was uh, uh, felt quite important uh, that for the period of parental leave up to 52 weeks, uh, the basic allowance should be paid. The panel did feel slightly differently, however, about special responsibilities allowance, allowances because uh, they are um, awarded to people who have uh, more experience uh, uh, for uh, those special responsibilities and therefore it's less likely to be something that somebody who is first standing for election uh, will take account of and therefore we felt it was appropriate that the um, SRAs should be uh, reduced over time as is set out in the report. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my introduction, uh, we also looked at carers' allowances. Uh, carers' allowances have been in the scheme of members' allowances for some years, albeit little used. Uh, but again, it is something that somebody who might be standing for election to the council may consider uh, as being important to ensure that they are covered for uh, um, child care or professional care for dependents. Um, the council has uh, a policy, as I've said, uh, and it is contained of the scheme of members' allowances. Uh, and again, we did a, a survey of peer councils to find out what they did. Um, as a result of that, we, um, we've come up with a number of uh, recommendations uh, because there were a couple of areas where, where we felt there were things that could be tightened up. Um, one of those was that um, uh, there's a um, confusing reference to payments made um, on actual expenditure up to a maximum of eight times the minimum wage, which we felt was um, very high. Um, and secondly, uh, we noted that the um, uh, childcare provision was only intended to uh, be carried out by professional uh, or qualified 
uh, people or organisations up to the age of eight, uh, and uh, we felt it should be to the age of 14. Um, and we also noted that um, there will be some people who have dependent children uh, who have special needs, and uh, they should, um, we felt, uh, uh, be uh, included in the care of dependence policy. Um, so um, we have made a number of uh, uh, recommendations covering uh, uh, these uh, various issues, and they are outlined in paragraph seven of the report. And attached as an annex, we've also got um, uh, a replacement section for section five, uh, which covers um, both uh, parental leave and carers allowances and takes on board all of the recommendations that uh, uh, we have come up with. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. I see a, a question from Hazel Pryor Sankey. Thank you, Chair. Just wondering if the uh, provisions are flexible enough to um, include carers' allowances, say, for example, if, if um, a councillor um, was uh, had charge of grandchildren, maybe, um, you know, legally had charge of them and therefore was needing to avail themselves of that, um, or um, in terms of, um, you know, a partner who was poorly, um, would, would, it, would it cover that? But particularly for the grandparents, or indeed if a, a councillor had a caring duty towards an adult child who became poorly, is it flexible enough to include that or, or not? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, it is uh, flexible uh, it, enough to include that, uh, I believe. Um, it is uh, uh, childcare um, uh, for people um, uh, in, for whom you have a responsibility. And so that may well uh, be uh, grandparents um, uh, having responsibility for their grandchildren. Uh, um, it is elderly, sick and dependent relatives uh, whilst you undertake approved duties. Thank you. I'm going to move to Councillor uh, David Fothergill to speak as the proposer. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. And first of all, can I start out by thanking um, the panel for leading this work and particularly to thank John Thompson um, for chairing the work. Um, I think that uh, when we discussed it uh, at full council last year, we all had a, a vague idea of what we thought it meant and we all had a vague idea on what we'd like it to do. Um, but in actual fact, uh, I think that the the, the independent uh, grouping have gone a lot further for us and have really uh, mapped out a really excellent scheme here. I, I'm very proud um, and I'm pleased to hear that we are one of the front runners in this area. I think that is an authority that looks after vulnerable people, that looks after children, that is responsible for a lot of uh, carers and, and the people who have been cared for. I think it is absolutely right that we set the trend here and it's always been my view that local authorities should be at the forefront of that. So I'm delighted that Somerset are. I'm delighted that we've risen to the, to the, uh, to the challenge uh, and I really would genuinely like to thank uh, John for his work and uh, would fully support it and fully support the recommendations. I'm delighted to, make, to be the proposer. Thank you, Councillor Fothergill. I'm going to go to Councillor Redmond to speak as seconder. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to second this motion. I wanted to speak specifically because of the great work done by the panel to implement changes to our allowance scheme. To introduce parental and carers leave in this way, as has been referenced, is pioneering in councils. This will make the role of councillor achievable to a larger demographic of our community who, because of potential loss of income, may not consider standing. We will hope that once fully endorsed by Council, we will be able to advertise this benefit and hope to encourage a more diverse and, dare I say, younger 
councillor in the next intake. Members, please support this great and trailblazing proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Redmond. I've got, I see a hand up from Adam Dance, please. Councillor Adam Dance. Yes, it was, it, it was actually um, before David spoke. It was just to say that Scott very kindly said that people must put their cameras on. And I've had two residents of the public message me um, because they actually can't, can't hear. And uh, Mike actually didn't have his camera on. So can I please remind um, councillors, put, put your camera on when you're speaking, as there is other people who can't, can't hear and they have to lip read. Um, so if, if we can keep that up, because it is in the government guidelines that we have to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dance, all noted. Councillor, I trust you've noted that. Councillor Christine Lawrence, please. I've just put the video on. Thank you, Chairman. I think this is a really, really interesting piece of work, obviously. Um, I, my husband was very poorly early in the year and I didn't need any help because unfortunately we had COVID and I stayed home with him, but I, I was able to work from home like everybody else. But had I not, had we not had COVID, I would have found it very difficult to work without somebody staying and keeping an eye on him. Whilst my family have been tremendously supportive, I would have needed help from somebody professionally at some point. So I can see from my own experience how vital this could be because one never knows when things go wrong and you need help. So I'm delighted that this piece of um, work has come forward and very thankful to John Thompson and his team, not for myself in particular, but for others that may be uh, in need of help in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. I see no more hands up there. Uh, there's a legacy hand up from Mr. Dance. Jane Locke. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased that uh, Somerset County Council is, is taking the lead on this. I can only speak from experience and uh, say when I was first elected and had preschool children, how difficult it was um, to cope with... Um, getting all their needs met and, and uh, attending council meetings um, and um, indeed my allowances quite often didn't even cover the childcare that I needed to find um, in order to attend meetings so I think this is really a good news story um, for, in, for, in so many ways. It's just a great shame that uh, people may have to wait until 2023 before they can take advantage of being the young people coming in who can actually make use of the, these proposals. Thank you. Thank you. I see no more hands up. So I'd like to make the point from the chair thanking John Thompson for the work, the sterling work that he and his associates do. And uh, we are really grateful for your contributions, Mr. Thompson. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I will now remind you the recommendations are that the council recommended to A, consider the panel's recommendations set out in section 7 of the panel's report attached as appendix A to this report and decide accordingly. B, to authorise the strategic manager, governance and democratic services to make any amendments to the scheme of members allowances 2020 to 2021 required as a result of the council's condition decisions in A above. So I'm going to pass this now to the monitoring officer to conduct. Mr Thank Woodridge. You. Thank you, Chair. And again, just prior to, well, just a point of clarity, I know, uh, know Councillor Lott made reference to a specific date then in terms of 2023. Again, just, just so members are fully aware, clearly subject to members voting on this, should these motions be agreed, these will then take immediate effect and therefore would be allowable for all current county councils. Can you put your camera on, please? Sorry, but can you put your camera on? That's a, no, that's a, that's a helpful reminder, Adam, particularly after I've been at pains to do the same myself. Um, again, ju just to remind everyone again, uh, subject to the council's um, agreement to these, uh, these motions then, that would mean these would come into immediate effect and therefore be available to, for all current county councillors. So if I just return to the vote then, I should be calling uh, councillors again by alphabetical order. 
and I shall start with Councillor Best. If you can Four. indicate whether you are in favour, against or abstaining. Four. Councillor Bowne. Four. Councillor Broom. Four. Councillor Clayton. Four. Councillor Caswell. Four. Councillor Chilcott. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Coles. Four. Councillor Dance. Four. Councillor Davies. Four. Councillor Dimmering. Four. Councillor Filmer. Four. Councillor Fothergill. Four. Councillor Prashini. Four. Councillor Govier. Four. Four. Councillor Grosscott. Four. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Ham. Four. Councillor James Hunt. Four. Councillor John Hunt. Councillor John Hunt. Still present. I should recall that as absent. Uh, Councillor Huxtable. Four. Councillor Keating. Four. Councillor Kendall. Four. Councillor Lawrence. Four. Councillor Lewis. Four. Councillor Leishon. Four. Councillor Jane Locke. Four. Councillor Tony Locke. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Munt. Four. Councillor Napa. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Noel. Four. Councillor Oliver. Four. Councillor Parham. Four. Councillor Paul. Four. Councillor Pryor Sankey. Four. Councillor Pullin. Four. Councillor Purbrick. Four. Councillor Redman. Happily four. Councillor Evans. Four, please. Councillor Rigby. Four. Councillor Taylor. Four. Councillor Thorne, I think it's indicated he votes four. Councillor Verdon. Four. Councillor Wallace. Four. Um, Councillor Weddercop. Four. Councillor Josh Williams. Four. Councillor Rod Williams. Four. Uh, Councillor Woodman. Four. And again, just to record that those that motion was passed by majority and therefore all those recommendations and agreed. And, and Chair, if I could just ask just for your own, uh, uh, your own admittance again, just to pass on again my own thanks and recognition to the work of the panel as well in supporting the Council with this work. Thank you, Scott, Mr. Woodbridge. May, may I just interrupt? I, I had put it in the chat, but unfortunately it hasn't come through. I, I couldn't get off mute, so it was a four for me as well, John Hunt. That was noted, John, and we saw it on the screen. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you, John. Taste and smell. Okay, I'm going to now move to item 12. That's, I'm getting a lot of feedback from somebody, from William Wallace, is it? Somebody who's discussing their cooking recipes there. I, I have Williams now. That's I Jane Locke. Certainly, certainly not me, Chairman. <laughs> thank you, William. I wouldn't have thought it would be you. Don't worry, anyway, uh, we, 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 we will move on to item 12, and that's the report of the Leader and Cabinet. Items for information, and you'll find these details on pages 251 to 254. Um, it's going to be uh, the Chair, I'm going to advising you that it's for information, and this is where members' questions to Cabinet members will also be considered. Men members' questions are set out in Annex A. So, members' questions to the Leader and Cabinet members will be taken under this item in the following order of speakers. Councillor Fothergill, um, uh, to start. Thank you, Chairman. So I'm still not used to going off mute. Um, so I'm happy to present uh, the report of the leader um, for, um, for this full council and happy to take any questions uh, that are arising. I'm already conscious that there's two, one I believe from Liz Lation and also one from um, Lee Redman. So uh, I'll take them in whichever order you prefer me. Help yourself, please, Jim. 
Liz, 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 do you want to read your question or are you happy to for me to respond? Uh, for, 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 for the record, it's probably better for you to, to read it. I would do, Chair. Um, leader, if I could find it. it it's about... Uh, would you like me to... Would you like yeah. me to read it for if you? If you'd like to read it for me, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. So, Liz Lation writes, How can members of this council be assured that the COVID-19 funding from government, now forming part of budget equalisation reserves, be spent where it is most needed for the residents of Somerset? This council has recently placed 9.5 million in a reserve, Cabinet decision 23rd of September, while other councils may need to draw on their reserves this financial year. Um, so thank you, Liz. Uh, yes, I can confirm that every penny of government funding provided for COVID-19 funding um, and, in fact, several millions of pounds of unfunded activity will be spent on our fight against this pandemic. We've seen significant cost pressures from COVID in the current year and also in the next financial year, which we have built into the MTFB. We will continue to update and inform members of the financial impacts of COVID throughout this monthly budget monitoring report to Cabinet and also to scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fothergill, you will now please answer uh, Councillor Redmond's question or Councillor Redmond, do you wish to read it? Councillor Redmond. I think as well the response is coming from the Chief Executive because it relates to uh, to council tax and care leavers. Okay, thank you. In that case, Chief Executive. Hey, sorry, Chair. I'm, Councillor Redmond, I am here. I do apologise. I was struggling to find my mute. I'm happy to, as long as the question is recorded in the minutes, I'm happy to take it as read, Chair, and listen to the response. Thank you. That's very good of you. Uh, in that case, I'm going to call on uh, Pat, the Chief Executive, please, to comment. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you uh, thank you for your uh, question, Councillor Redmond. And indeed, you did quite rightly raise this matter with me. I have raised it a couple of times now and asked if I would chase this through with my colleagues in district councils, uh, which, which I've du duly done on a couple of occasions. And what I'd also say is that some of the commentary that I, I give in the response here is, is is provided by children's services and colleagues who are working this arena. So it's it's not, it's not it's, uh, absolutely backed up with our experience to date. So I can... Um, I can confirm and start by saying that all district councils have provision in place uh, for a degree of exemption uh, for, for care leavers. I'd love to be able to tell you that all district councils support this council's opinion uh, that all care leavers should be exempt from council tax to the age of 25, uh, which is in line with the nationally recognised uh, good practice. Uh, and this has been our clear and consistent advice over the last year or two. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the four districts continue to have uh, their own approaches. Uh, Sedgemoor, Mendip and Somerset, Western Taunton now have agreed at different times at a strategic level that they will exempt all Somerset care leavers from council tax to the age of 25, which is good news. However, I'm advised that it's only the Sedgemoor, in, Se the, in Sedgemoor that care leavers feel that the process is clear and that the, that the staff are respectful to their circumstances in other, er in, in other er er districts areas uh, we have found uh, staff who appear to be uh, unaware of the exemption uh, report re resulting in senior county council managers regularly having to intervene uh, to ensure that the exemption is provided uh, as agreed and uh, just to comment on that that we absolutely do follow these through and we do provide that feedback uh, to the organisation. Uh, South Somerset continues, uh, we understand it's our latest ask, South Somerset continues to exempt only those uh, who are up to the age of 21 and then they employ an individualised approach uh, uh, up to 25. Uh, our view is it, it is a shame that we have an inconsistent approach when we ought to have the most advantageous, uh, accessible system possible uh, for the benefit of those most vulnerable young children across the whole of the county. Uh, uh, as a result, our care leavers continue uh, to experience a variation in support depending upon where they live. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Chief Executive. I'm going to move now to Councillor Mandy Chilcott and invite Councillor Liz Leishon to ask her submitted question about COVID-19 funding. Councillor Leishon. Oh, I think the leader's responded. I think we've done that one. 
Thank you, Chair. But we have covered that one already. I think okay. it may have got picked up twice by mistake. Yes, I, th Thank I think it has. And that's uh, my fault for not amending the uh, running order. Thank you, Councillor Leishon. That lets Councillor Chilcott off the uh, hook there. We'll move to Councillor John Woodman. And I'm going to invite Councillor Woodman to summarise key points from his annual report. Councillor Woodman. Thank you very much, Chairman. Can you see me all right? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, well, I'm proud to be the, the Cabinet Member for Highways and Transport and have this opportunity to highlight some of the key points from my report. My report highlights the key activities and achievements over this past year. Despite challenging circumstances, you will note that several key transport policies and investment initiatives have been progressed, ranging from securing government investment in several major transport schemes to developing bids to support walking and cycling in our major towns and transport elements of the climate emergency strategy. I'm delighted that our work on design and construction of our highway schemes such as Squivers Way and Yeovil Western Corridor has been recognised by the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. We won um, innovation and um, other awards there and also the Institute of Civil Engineers as well and we want to consider it Constructors Code of Practice Award as well. Our uh, investment in maintaining our county's highway network has continued both routine maintenance and a number of high profile maintenance schemes. Furthermore, we continue to make efficiency improvements in the delivery of our high, highways maintenance activities. We also continue to progress a number of minor improvement schemes and other initiatives which we know are important and valued to our community. Our transport team has worked tirelessly throughout this year to support the transportation of NHS patients, school and college students, and work closely with bus operators in summit to, to ensure that the impacts of the pandemic are actively managed. Finally, throughout the year, our highways and transport staff have worked incredibly hard to support our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it be supporting the reopening of household waste recycling centres or the implementation of active travel measures in some of our Somerset towns to enable social distancing in our high streets, supporting health and social care transport and the coordinated delivery of over five and a half thousand PPE packages to our care homes during the early period of this pandemic. To name but a few examples, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for their hard work and their commitment throughout these unprecedented times. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Woodman, thank you. I'm now going to invite any members to ask any questions on the Cabinet Members' annual report. Could you show, please, for the putting your hand up? I've got two, I think. I've got Lee and Mike. Uh, no, no, I'm coming to those. Yeah, I'm, I'm not referring to those. I'm just asking if oh. any members in the room, have got, in the um, on the meeting, have got any questions on your report. No, I see no hands. Then I'm going to move to Councillor Lee Redmond to ask his submitted question in Annex A. Again, Chair, quick on the draw. Managed to find the mute button this time. Uh, I'm happy to, to take the question as written and listen with excitement to the Cabinet Member's response. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Woodman. Thank you very much, Lee. Right, hang on. I am pleased to say that the Small Improvement Scene programme will feature in our budget proposals in the in the forthcoming over the next coming months. And uh, well, I just all I can hope is it's supported by all you know all parties. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Woodman. I'm going to ask Councillor Rigby to ask his submitted question in Annex A, please. Thank you. It's fairly brief, so I'll, I'll read it out just for the benefit of those who perhaps haven't seen it. Uh, John, in September, Community Secretary Robert Jenrick announced that government was awarding itself the power to build, build Brexit lorry parks, required in the event that contrary to promises made, cross-border trade was not in fact frictionless and significant numbers of lorries could not get out of the country as planned. These lorry parks would not require planning permission and would be built without reference to local residents. Somerset County Council is on the list where such lorry parks can be built. Can you tell us where in Somerset these lorry parks might be built and detail the consultation that this council has had with government before and after the new legislation was introduced? Thank you. Councillor Woodman to respond. 
Thank you, Mike. I have to be very, very clear on this. I'm not aware of any requests for lorry parks in Somerset. And on the 8th of October, the government published an update of the border operating model. That document gives the locations for new border infrastructure that includes lorry parks. There are none planned for the southwest. Thank you, Councillor Woodman. I'd like to thank you for your annual report, uh, Councillor Woodman. And I'm now going to move to Councillor Frances Nicholson and to ask her to summarise the key points from her annual report. Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Having real trouble with mute buttons and what's it. Uh, I can hear you. Apologies. Can you now see me? Uh, not yet. Mm. You're coming on no. online, I think. You're, yes, you are. You're online now. Right. Thank you. Splendid. Thank you very much. Um, I commend as uh, very well worthwhile reading, um, if any member hasn't read it yet, um, the annual report um, from the lead member of Children's Services. It is, I think, really important that all members... Um, particularly as corporate parents of our children looked after, but as the elected members answerable for um, the, the work of the County Council, uh, I really recommend this as, as, as a worthwhile reading um, to, talk, to show the breadth of the work and the support that's done uh, through the County Council with its partners, because um, no one organisation can do the work that is needed without the partners. Um, we work to um, a children's, so a, 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 an hour plan, a children and young people's plan that was co-produced uh, with through consultations um, with young people so that we heard very clearly what it is that they wanted. Um, they wanted supported families, healthy lives, great education, positive activities. The report uh, talks about this year's work um, in achieving that plan. I don't want to single out any particular service other than to say, um, particularly through the current situation, the, uh, the COVID situation, staff have worked long and hard to ensure that they are meeting the needs of children and will continue to do so. Uh, and happy to take any questions. Right, uh, I'm throwing it open then to members of uh, uh, councillors. If you have any questions to ask the cabinet members annual report, please. I see no hands going up. So I'm uh, Jane Locke. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask the cabinet member um, around about the Ofsted send report and um, I understand that the written statement of action uh, did go in in September. I'm not aware that the that statement of action or any report on it has been offered to members and I wondered if that was going to happen and when we could see it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, no, it hasn't yet been seen by members. Uh, it remains subject to discussion with CQC and Ofsted and our partners uh, to bring it to its um, completed final form, at which point uh, it, will, uh, it, it will become available. It doesn't you, mean to say the work isn't going on at this, as, as we speak. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. There being no further questions, I will now refer to invite uh, Councillor Rigby to ask his submitted questions in Annex A about funding for families in need. Councillor Rigby. Thank you, Chair. At the beginning of the recent half term, in response to pressure from Marcus Rashford's campaign, Somerset County Council announced a fund of £125,000 to help families in need through the holidays. Please can you tell me how much of that fund was spent during the autumn half term and what it was spent on? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, um, uh, uh, as you say, the County Council announced that it would add an extra £125,000 to the funding that had been made available by government to address whole population food needs in Somerset. Arrangements were already in place to support families through the half term, so none of this £125,000 was spent during the autumn half term. However, at that time, there remained concern about provision over the winter 
uh, and it was considered prudent to boost the funds available to address winter need. Members may wish to note that the council strategy was and is to support local arrangements to ensure that support can reach as far as possible. Uh, during half term, any families who needed help with food, whether or not they were eligible for free school meals, were asked to check the national websites for local food solutions, for example, help out now schools, help out now schools out, or ring the coronavirus helpline, and it's always worth repeating the number, 0300 790 6275. Where there was not a local offer in place, the, the council was able to provide frozen meals or else help from the village agents. 700 frozen meals uh, were dispatched to village agents to support families in need, and village agents supported 150 families. And the Somerset County Council would like to thank the many community groups and suppliers who donated meals to children during October half term. We welcome the extra funding that has recently been made available by government and arrangements for food support over the winter, which will include the 125000 that we have set aside, are being finalised. When they are complete, both the members' information sheet, a press release and all necessary publicity will be issued. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Councillor Nicholson, can I make a point of thanking you particularly for A, a your commitment and B, for your annual report? I acknowledge both. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I have on my list here Councillor Claire Paul, but I don't believe Claire has anything to say unless she wishes to make a comment. Councillor Paul? Open for questions, Chair. Thank you. Open for questions. So any councillor? Jane Locke's got a... Yeah, yeah. Councillor Jane Locke. Thank you, Chair. I, I would just like to ask the Cabinet member, um, she said that none of the £125,000 was actually spent during half term, um, but I understood, and, and maybe the decision was taken not to purchase, um, vouchers um, for families that were struggling. Was that decision um or, or did that not happen, or, was, or were vouchers purchased from a different source? Uh, if, if I may, Mr Chairman, uh, vouchers were not uh, purchased for the autumn half term. There was no means um, at that point um, of, uh, 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 of uh, doing that, uh, which is why we put other arrangements in place. And I would particularly commend to the Council's consideration the fact that um, many families at the moment are in need, some of whom are um, um, are um, in receipt of free school meals, some of whom are not eligible for them. And it seemed a much more useful exercise to ensure that those families who were in need, who identified for themselves that they were in need, could be supported. Uh, this was better done with the scheme that uh, we had in place and had developed. Um, that is why um, it, it, it had already been organised, had already been funded. Um, it, the 125,000 was extra money which will be used through the winter. I understand that. Um, in, in which case, I was actually um, misled, Chair. Um, could I come back and ask one more question? You welcome the government funding, uh, which has to last, as I understand it, through to the summer holidays or through to the other end of the summer holidays. Um, do you think that will be sufficient or will Somerset County Council need to be topping that up as well? Thank you. Uh, and on the analysis of data so far and the projections that we have, the schemes that we are developing will do what needs to be done. None of us, of course, can predict the future wholly safely. Um, that's the only caveat that I would make. Thank you. Well, I'm going to one of my tasks, Mike Ridley, I would have my task to briefly follow up to my question. Mike, please. I don't see your hand up and I don't see your, your face on the screen. Can you 
to help out with that, please? I am appearing. Is that better? That's a bit better. It's only, uh, uh, as Councillor Dance did ask for people to uh, say so people could read their lips. So, and it might be hard with our, our moustaches, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm okay. um, Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. I just want to briefly, thank you. I just want to ask briefly that if, if um, none of the £125,000 was spent, what was spent during half term on providing uh, food for uh, families in need from whatever source? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, was part, it, was part, it was part of the uh, funding which had been provided for government for whole population food which um, was designated for that. If the, if the member would like um, a, a separate meeting to discuss very specific things, then I can certainly offer that. It Thank was done. It has been done. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go back to and apologise to Councillor Claire Paul because uh, I thought we'd finished uh, Councillor Francis Nicholson, who again I thank for her contributions. Councillor Claire Paul, any questions for her, please, for the councillor? No, I don't hear any questions for Claire Paul. So I'm going to move to Councillor David Paul, please. I'm going to invite David to summarise the key points from his annual report. Councillor David Hall. Thank you very much, Chairman. Can I just do a sound and visual check? Can you hear me OK? You're, you're fine. Yes, you're fine. Both Thanks. sound and vision. Thank you very much. And it is with great pleasure that I uh, present my annual report as a Cabinet Member for Economic Development, Community Infrastructure and Planning. Uh, many friends and colleagues will recall one of my favourite sayings of the past has been prosperity pays for everything. And it's with no little trepidation that I predict that this will most certainly need to be the case in the months and years to come as we hopefully move forward and out of the difficult and challenging times we're currently all working through. A prosperous and sustainable economy for Somerset is, as ever, my personal goal and that I believe we should all be striving for in the future. We need to continue to focus on helping our business and our uh, communities to recover as quickly as possible from the impacts of the pandemic. Speaking of these difficult times, I, I think it would be quite inappropriate for me to single out for praise the offices, offices of any one area of what members will recall is an extremely broad and diverse portfolio. So in commending this report to Council as read, I don't hesitate to offer my heartfelt praise and gratitude to all officers at all levels who have worked so hard within their departments. My report hopefully reflects their outstanding levels of commitment and achievement for Somerset over the past 12 months. And before I finish, if I may, I'd just finally like to say how proud I am to see Somerset's climate emergency strategy receive approval today. This was an initiative that started under my responsibility, which is why it also features in my report, uh, with the direction of the climate emergency for Somerset at a previous council. The development of the strategy has been taken forward by Councillor Paul and her team, and I'm delighted to see all their combined efforts come to fruition today. The work on implementation has only just started, however, and I hope we will all of us come together to deliver the strategy as we go forward. Uh, that's, at that point, I'll pause, Chairman, but as always, happy to try and answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Members, I'm throwing it to you. Have you any questions for Councillor Hall, please? I don't see any hands going up, so, Councillor Hall, I'd like to thank you for your annual report, and perhaps if you remind me, I'll, I'll send you a, a, a tie, Somerset County Council tie, so you can complete, complete your ensemble. That would be very generous of you, Chairman. Thank you. Could you send me one of those stick-on moustaches that you sent to Councillor Rigby as well, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Bill Revens is actually He's coming now and wants to uh, ask you a question. Um, my apologies, uh, Mr Chairman. I, I thought my, my hand was up, um, but obviously it was too surreptitious um, for, for, for you to notice, so um, my apologies. Um, uh, Mr. I can't, can't find the page reference, uh, uh, I apologise, Councillor Hall, but it's uh, 2.2.13, where you talk about Hinkley um, requesting further uh, workforce in early stages of the new year. Um, can I ask whether there will be any measures as 
part of that to look at the highways implication of any increase on in their workforce and also the um, well-being aspects of the COVID um, the situation that we now find ourselves in. I know that there's been a particular uh, difficulty um, at the Hinkley C site and I'm anxious to keep our local community safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill, for your question. Um, uh, dealing with the second part first, I can confirm that um, EDF and uh, all the other contractors on site uh, to continue to operate a very rigorous regime around social distancing, uh, COVID testing, temperature testing, self-isolation and so on. So whilst inevitably uh, a, a construction site of that, period, of that size uh, there will be cases of COVID unfortunately occurring from time to time. I'm confident that those measures will continue to be effective. And moving to the first part of your question, yes, of course, that will be taken into account in any proposals for worker uplift, as indeed will any implications for transport infrastructure uh, in the immediate area and indeed in, in the wider catchment area of the site. If at any time uh, you need any detailed information, uh, particularly as the situation develops, I, I'm happy for you to contact me directly and I'll keep you informed. Thank you, Councillor Hall, and uh, thank you, Bill, for your comments. I see no further hands up and checking again the screen, there's no further hands. So, Councillor Hall, many thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor David Huxtable, um, I don't know whether there's anybody got any questions for you? Or whether you wish to say anything? <laughs> I know, Chairman, I, Chairman, all I, silence from Councillor uh, Huxtable. Uh, Chairman, I think um, I'll just show you that I am properly dressed for the day. Um, <laughs> no, I have nothing. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody's got any. Thank you, Chairman. You're lucky, Councillor Huxtable. They're giving you a free run. And, and, and I, I, I'm like to see the time. Very smart. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move on before I get sung out. Um, Councillor Christine Lawrence, um, again, I don't know if the Councillor would like to make any comments or if any of the colleagues have got questions. Uh, so Councillor Lawrence, any comments you wish to make? Yes, I, I would just like to mention a couple of things, if that's okay. I just would like to thank... Um, I'd like to thank everyone that's worked so hard in the last few months, but obviously you can't do that. But are those people that work behind the scenes, particularly those people that have been working on the um, COVID number that Francis spoke, spoke about early, and the people in the contact centre, they have answered seven or 8,000 uh, um, phone calls and done a magnificent job seven days a week and they're still doing it and these really are the backup behind the public health work that is going on so I just think that you know we ought to try as much as we can to be really grateful to all these people that have worked so hard to be sure that we're reaching out to all those people in Somerset uh, that need help and still I must re what Francis said is right. You know, if you've got a problem, then ring in and make sure that we can get the information we need to help you. And also to Simon Clifford, who's being uh, chairing the multi agency, uh, I call it a task force because I think that's what it really is. Across the set, bringing the police, the district council, the frontline services, and everybody together to make sure that we all work together. And I think all those people deserve our thanks and will continue to support us in the next few months. But thank you all very much. Thank you, Councillor Christine Lawrence. Anybody with any questions for Councillor Lawrence? I see no hands going up. No questions. So thank you again. Councillor Faye Perbrick, I'm going to invite you to summarise the key points from your annual report. Councillor Perbrick. Thank you, Chair. Um, my report starts with the line, 2020 has been an extraordinary year with unprecedented challenges, and it certainly has been. Who would have imagined that this time last year we'd all be working from home uh, and that we'd be holding our full council meeting virtually? But in a nutshell, that demonstrates the enormous strides forward that have been taken by our organisation this year, led by our transformation, ICT and digital teams. And it's a testament to their skills, knowledge and hard work that we've achieved so much, despite unparalleled challenges and many of our resources being diverted to support the emergency coronavirus response. 
evidence of our innovative approach to technology can be found throughout our services, from automated library services and data intelligence reporting, to robots in schools and apps to improve the way patients are discharged from hospital. In that same vein, the development of our digital customer experience platform will improve lives for residents by empowering those who wish to, to self-serve and self-help. And our investment in ICT has allowed 3,500 staff to work effectively from home, conducting 5,000 virtual meetings per week. But on the flip side, our fantastic schools have remained open throughout this pandemic, thanks to the amazing educational professionals across our county and to the support of our teams. We've rejuvenated relationships with our schools and stepped up when our most vulnerable children need us most. And our investment in new and expanded schools has continued to deliver fantastic learning spaces for students across the county. And finally, we've carried out an extensive engagement with communities and partners to develop our One Somerset business case. And as we look to the future and to support this county's economic and social recovery and renewal from this pandemic, this work is going to be critical, and we look forward to delivering our final business case to government in a few weeks' time. The fact that we've achieved so much, despite the external pressures, is down to our fantastic staff, and I'd like to use this platform to thank them all publicly for their tireless efforts. And I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Um, councillors, any questions for Councillor Faber Perdrick? I see no hands going up. Uh, Jane Long? Thank you, Chair. If I could ask um, the Cabinet member, please. Um, going back to the SEND improvement program, um, as we read on, we, we, we find out a little more information. Um, and I see that it, it says here that an improvement framework has been put in place and we are awaiting approval from inspectors before beginning delivery, which is... Um, more than I knew a few minutes ago, and um, I just wondered if she could possibly comment on anything that may give us a clue as to what the framework um, that has been put in place consists of, um, and when we can expect approval from the inspectors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Look, um, although this is part of the overall transformation programme, I think it would be prudent to pass back to the Cabinet member responsible for SEND education um, to, to answer you on that matter. Mr Chairman, um, I don't know whether you can see me. I'm, I can still hear what's going on, but my screen is doing something very peculiar. Our screens have as well, I'm afraid. We seem to have lost... Uh, I think somebody may be sharing their screen when they've been drawing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 So, okay. I think you've been drawing in your spare time. Yeah, you've now shared your screen. I apologise to everybody wrong. listening in at the moment. We've got a slight technical uh, problem here, which our technical specialists are looking at. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, shall no, I... Could you, could, you just, could you hang on, please, until I know everybody's back online? Right. Is everybody back with us now? Okay. Um, Councillor Nicholson, Councillor Love, uh, Lawrence, you're showing. Councillor yeah. Nicholson, um, please. Uh, the uh, the uh, we're talking about the written statement of action, the plans for uh, for moving forward and making uh, making the improvements that we need to make. Um, this is merely um, subject to the uh, the well two points to make. One uh, that improvement work has been going on since well before inspection continues to go on is not not there because um, the um, plan is not finally formalized um, the uh, plan is going through the normal process of finalization discussion and fine-tuning and will be shared as soon as that is completed Right, I'm going to return back to Councillor Faye Perbrick who was in the middle of giving her presentation and awaiting questions um, has, has anybody got any further questions for Councillor Perbrick? So yeah, I can give my Bill, Bill, Bill Redmond and Mike Best. Mike Best first, please. Councillor Best. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just a question to Councillor Perbrick. Um, obviously, at the moment, um, we're going through the consultation period uh, with the schools in Crooked and Leominster. 
um, <clears throat> which I, I thoroughly uh, welcome. But one comment that I've got uh, is the uh, uh, how to link into these meetings. The site, uh, the web page is not very clear. And also, I think I've al already said to you the ticketing wasn't very straightforward e either. So I know that there is a meeting this evening. Is it possible to add something to the web page that makes it more straightforward on how you find the link into the meetings? Thank you. Councillor Perverick, uh, per per do you wish to respond? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Besson, and thank you for your support of the, the consultation process. It's really important that we hear as many views as possible and answer as many questions as possible as we go through this consultation process. Um, I know that the, the issues that you mentioned were, were raised yesterday um, with officers, uh, and I will speak to them again later to make sure that we haven't received further um, queries and, and, and issues with people trying to access. Absolutely, we will we'll put as much support together as possible to make sure as many people as possible can get online. I know we had a really uh, strong turnout last night, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to speaking to more parents again this evening. Thanks for your question. Thank you. I'm going to Councillor Bill Revens uh, next, please. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman, and thank you for your report, Councillor Purbrick. Um, I very much welcome the extra school places on the east side of Bridgewater at Willow Down Bridgewater College Academy. Uh, I wonder whether the um, portfolio holder could make some time to have a look at whether there is sufficient school places being offered where the building of new homes is taking place to the uh, south of the Bridgewater in my division. I'm very aware that we have a planning permission for a new school at Willstock, but it still is not on the capital programme. Um, I'm aware that the other schools in my division are at capacity and it is a, it is a ex frequently expressed view from local residents that they are concerned about the future uh, education of children in the area. Thank you. Councillor Burbrick, do you wish to respond? Yes, thank you, Councillor Evans. I'd be happy to have a meeting with you to discuss the particularities of, of the case that you're, you're talking about. Um, rest assured, the, the admissions team and the school place planning team take very careful consideration of, of places available and planning um, that is, and, and new housing that is coming down the line um, when pulling together our, uh, our capital plan for new schools, but happily um, we'll meet with the member to discuss the matter in question and uh, and get officers involved in, in any reassurance or action that needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to now invite Councillor Tessa Munt to ask her submitted question in Annex A. Councillor Munt. Councillor Tessa Munt, please. Hello. Hello, but we've, we've not got, got you on camera, camera Tessa. Yes. No, not yet. Well, it looks to me as though I am. <laughs> uh, I, I can, can assure, assure you, you've not got the main screens. Yeah, just, just come on now. You, just come on now. We've got, got you a bit. All right. Actually, just my signal is so poor. Please, can I ask Scott to read my question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just the benefit of uh, members of the public and elected members. Uh, Councillor Munn's question uh, relates to COVID-19 and IT. Uh, question is, uh, how many laptops, computers and tablets have been distributed during the first coronavirus lockdown from supplies held A, by the government, B, by Somerset County Council, and then related to Somerset County Council, to Somerset students and in which years of school or college, and two, to other individuals. And I the councillor's question, Chair. Councillor Burbrick, did you hear all of that? Yes, thank you. Do you wish Chair. to reply now or do you wish to give a written reply? I'm happy to reply now, but if there's further detail that Councillor Tom would want, I'm also happy to expand further. There's lots of data on this, but uh, um, I'm happy to respond with the outline data now. Um, Councillor Mark, thanks very much for your question. 
Uh, prior to the Department of Education in initiative, the County Council agreed a scheme to use funds from selling old council devices to buy laptops that could be made available to children and young people. And to date, around 70 of these devices have been given out. Um, and more recently, we've also loaned 100 second-hand devices to schools to help with home learning. But on the subject of uh, the government uh, funding and programme, the government asked us to bid for laptop computers at various stages throughout the pandemic. And some of the county council bid for the maximum um, that we could each time. Uh, our total allocation for the Department of Education is 998, we're just shy of that 1,000 figure. Um, and these have been allocated as follows. So we've had 515 to children with a social worker, 156 to disadvantaged children in year 10, and councillors will remember there was a particular scheme around that. Um, 36 to schools as a reserve for them to use according to need. 122 to schools through further requests, again, as need arises. Um, and that comes to a, a total of 829 laptops. Um, there were also, um, we also allocated 192 dongles. Um, which is, is how people can connect to the internet um, if they haven't got that access easily. Um, an additional 42 of those also made available for Year 10 students. In addition to this, um, there's been funding provided um, by the Department for Education through the West Somerset Opportunity Area um, for the pilot project there that is specifically aimed at students in that area. And that included funding for Chromebooks provided for reception to Year 7 students, Laptops for students in year 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13, where devices were not already available at home. And students in the West Somerset Opportunity Area also um, who received a device that didn't have or had limited digital connectivity in their home will be supported for a year with uh, uh, an aforementioned dongle um, providing unlimited data for them. Um, so, the current situation is from the main DfE allocation, sorry, the Department for Education allocation of computers that we had. There are currently between 100 and 200 laptops that are available still for schools to use. Um, and these are allocated, prioritising those who are new into care or children looked after. And uh, with the current situation, the way it stands at the point of a school bubble being closed due to a confirmed coronavirus case, um, we receive a list of all the vulnerable pupils within that year. And the head of the school is then invited to make contact to discuss the laptop ordering process um, and, and be made aware of what that allocation is. On top of all this, Council of Mountain, I'm sure other councillors will also be aware that alongside the government devices and the devices that we purchased and the devices on loan, we're also working with a stock of around 50 of the AB1 robots. Um, and we've tried to ensure that these are able to be accessed more easily under the current circumstances. They can be borrowed for the two-week self-isolation period or loaned for a longer time to young people who are unable to attend school at this time due, due to being um, clinically extremely, extremely vulnerable, uh, along with the standard loan scheme that we launched at the start of the year for students unable to attend education for a variety of reasons. Um, and just to finish, we've held back a small reserve of, of laptop devices to support those uh, children currently clinically extremely vulnerable uh, on that list and schools and partners across children's um, services are aware of this. So happy if there's more detail that you would like to provide that in, in writing, but uh, hopefully that gives the, uh, the headlines of, of what's been done to support our young people and their education. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Chair. If I can just ask... Um, I assume I will get that answer in writing anyway, um, but um, I'm just concerned about the number of young people who have no access. I know you said you have a number of dongles that you have given out, um, but I just am concerned about the number of young people who just don't have access to the internet because it's so flaky across the, across the county. Um, and I was hopeful that hmm. there would be a way in which we could increase access through dongles perhaps. Um, and I was quite surprised only to find 70. If you say 70, um, County Council laptops for the people that have been handed out. Is that correct? Yes, Council Month. So the way that the County Council funded laptops work, work are when we when a, a laptop goes out of service for a council user, we sell those to a firm who recycles them and pays us a fee um, for each laptop, and then we purchase the laptop. So this is an ongoing scheme with with all old tech within the council to make sure we're recycling 
the, the equipment um, and taking the money that we get from that to purchase computers. So it's an ongoing scheme for our, van, our vulnerable um, children and, and care leavers that will continue beyond this. With regards to the connectivity that you talk about, we're absolutely doing everything we can to make sure as children have access. And I would ask if you're hearing of individual circumstances of children who are having difficulties, please report it through to the, the children's team. Um, because there are resources and people available to, to help support this. As you'll have heard from that answer, I will absolutely give you a, a, a written version of that and hopefully a member's briefing with even more detail coming soon. Um, but there are the resources and the abilities for us to support. Um, and if, if you feel that people aren't being able to access that, please do bring them forward to us so that we can support as many children as we can. Thank you, Faye. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Councillor Purbrick, for your report and uh, the diligence with which you put into your work. Thank you. Um, as to remind Council now that we've actually dealt with items 13, 14, 15 and 16, that was the Cabinet Member Annual Reports, as part of this agenda item. So we're now going to move to item 17, which you find on page 10 of your agenda. And that's the report of the Scrutiny for Policies, Adults and the Health Committee. It's going to be introduced by Council Hazel, Hazel Pryor Sankey, and she is the Chair of Scrutiny for Pod Policy, Adults and Health Committee. Council Hazel Pryor Sankey, please. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, members just present the uh, report for adults and health scrutiny. Um, it's quite a comprehensive report, not too long, so I hope you will be able to read it. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Any questions, please, for uh, Councillor? I, I see nobody's hands up. Anybody? David Huxtable, is your hand up? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Could you go on video, video please, David? David? I think I am. You are now. Possibly not quite as high res as some, but there we are. Um, uh, yes, no, I would I would just like to, it would be remiss of me not to thank Hazel for her excellent chairmanship of, of this committee. Uh, the new skills that she has learned in lockdown has been a, a lesson to us all. Um, we we all miss Hazel's. Um, oh, I couldn't say that. We all miss Hazel's uh, confectionery and buns. Oh, I said it now. I was trying to avoid doing that. Um, and uh, so so I suspect we've all we've all lost a little weight as a, as, a, as a benefit of that in some ways. But um, all 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 play to, to Hazel, and I think she's even. Although she looks suspiciously like she might be in county I even think her home Wi-Fi is better now. Thank yeah, you, Hazel. Yes, it is. We paid vast sums of money to have new wiring, and we had uh, work done on our pole. There was a, a 1930s Baker-like connection, so it's much better from home. I am sitting in my kitchen where I've been all day. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I see no other questions for Hazel. And may I make uh, a point, because I know from when I served on your subcommittee how dedicated and how instructive you were and considerate to all people. And uh, I, you, you were a good um, guide to follow, Hazel, and I take my hat off to you. Thank you very much indeed. And can I also again thank you for your consideration in placing my wreath on the cenotaph um, last week for the Remembrance uh, Service Day on the Tuesday. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, there being no other questions there, um, this report is for noting, so duly noted, and uh, we will now move to item 18, that's the report of the Scrutiny for Policies, Children and Families Committee, and it's going to be introduced by Councillor Lee Redman. Councillor Redman. Thank Chair, thank you. As always, I'd like to formally thank officers for their support. Again, I would remind members of council and officers working for council that they are the committee's eyes and ears. So please feel free to make suggestions for items that might that the committee might look into. I will take this opportunity to remind members of council and again members of the public listening or watching online. We do have co-opted spaces for school governors to join the committee available and of course, they can be, would be involved in education-related matters. 
Chair, I'm going to spoil you now just as you put the glass to your mouth and say I'm happy to take questions <laughs> about the business reported in the meet, in the papers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to Councillor Edmund. And is that, this is the penalty for being pinned to the screen. I can't even take a drink of water. Um, any members got any questions for Councillor Lee Redmond, please? Faye Perbrick. Councillor Faye Perbrick. Thank you, Chair. Um, just really wanted to, to add my thanks to, to Lee and all of his scrutiny committee for the amazing work that they've done. Um, since since we uh, last received a report, there's, uh, there's so much going on within the education and children's world at the moment. Um, and it's great to, to have a, a scrutiny team who are, are keeping the checks and balances on that and are bringing forward some really great work and ideas. So uh, thanks Lee, to you and the team and uh, please keep up the great work. Thank you, Councillor Perbrick, and I think that was uh, uh, good fine words from Lee Redmond, because I know yes. he's totally committed. You want to say something else, Lee? I just need to, to thank, thank uh, Councillor Perbrick for her comments, and perhaps do a, a, a slight trailer for members should they wish to do. Of course, on the afternoon of the 2nd of December, our next meeting is likely to be a two-item meeting, of which will be some really interesting topics, including the first item, which is the crew kernel, which is the school proposals, and secondly, the, the written statement of action. So two really exciting items that we'd like to have a good debate over. So please, members and members of the public, feel free to take part. There's the end of the hour, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I see hands up from Mike Best and Bill Revens, unless these are legacy, legacy hands. Sorry, Chair, I should have taken it down. Thank you, Mike. Bill? Oh, well, you've just put it down, Bill, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you all. I'll try to keep my hands myself now. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, all of you. Um, again, Lee, many thanks for your report, and I'm sure all the members are very grateful. We're going to move to item 19 to be introduced by Councillor Anna Groskop, Chair of the Scrutiny for Policies in Place. This item will be for noting only. Councillor Anna Groskop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the knobs just would not work. Anyway, um, I recommend this uh, report to you. Um, I would highlight the improvements we've made. Uh, we have uh, a committee members that have stayed the whole year, which has been quite something. Uh, cabinet members are attending our meetings. Uh, I thank uh, Councillor Chilcott especially for always presenting her financial report and would like this from other cabinet members in the future, if at all possible. I I'm very proud of the Climate Change and Emergency Strategy Report and thank profusely Councillor Mund and Councillor Fillmore for their input. They worked really hard. I would like to thank the financial team for improving the way they present their reports and they're going to try even harder so that all of us can understand the financial report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any members, any questions for Councillor Groscott, please? Thank you. Um, I have to extend uh, my thanks to Anna and the committee. Um, I know there are really regular and lots of financial reports throughout the year, but I do think their monitoring and watching of them has certainly helped with this council sort of financial turnaround. So thank you to you and your committee and all the work that you do. Thank you, Councillor Chilcott. Uh, and Councillor Faye Perbrick, I believe your hand was up. It's not showing us up at my end, but it must be a legacy hand, sorry. It was a legacy hand, thank you. Well, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you very much for your report and for your colleagues that uh, do this work. Uh, that's very, I'm very grateful. We're going to move to item 20, which I hope will probably be the shortest report of the day, as it's the last one. Uh, it is an important one, and I think, Rod, uh, you know, uh, try, and, uh, try and confine yourself to the same points, please. Thank you. Mr Chairman, thank you. I will do, as ever. Uh, I'm very conscious this is item 20 of a long for council meeting, so I shall be brief. My report is a comprehensive but succinct account of a year's work. The report covers a wide range of work that our very small team conducts on behalf of the leader. 
Next, to, next year, members will wish to know that the government will turn the Armed Forces Covenant into law. I trust members will welcome this, as I do. Work to prepare this is well underway, and SEC officers have contributed advice to central government on how the new legislation could help the beneficiaries of the covenant in social care, health, housing and education. This is covered in my report. I would like to thank the District Armed Forces Champions, among them Mark Healy and Andy Kendall, for their work during the year. The four District Champions are key partners in our Somerset Partnership. On behalf of members, I would like to thank the two officers from Public Health who have supported me now for three years in leading the Armed Forces Covenant Partnership in Somerset. One of those officers, Chris Phillips, has earned promotion and has gone to another area in public health. I will be sad to lose him, but congratulate him on his promotion. The other officer, Kirsty Conger, did most of the work to compile this report for you and has led the large effort we have made throughout the year to communicate well across the partnership. Given that Kirsty was an apprentice only three years ago, this is a remarkable achievement. On your behalf, I record my thanks to both officers. Finally, I believe the Somerset Armed Forces Covenant Partnership has continued to work well, is overseeing successful delivery of the Covenant in Somerset. Members, I commend the report to you and welcome any questions you may have on the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, Thank you, Rod. Rod. Over, Over to members. I don't see any hands going up. Uh, David Fothergill. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, we do give Rod a bit of stick sometimes, and I've got to say his reports are always very good and very succinct, so uh, so uh, he takes it in a good part, but thank you, Rod. And uh, I really would like to pay tribute to him for the work that he does do with the Armed Forces Covenant, uh, and he has got a very small team at County Hall here. Um, but this is really important work. Um, it was introduced for a reason, and, and I'm delighted that we've stepped forward, and I'm delighted that we take it so seriously and play play a regional role as well. And um, you know, if if ever we needed a square peg in a square hole, it's Rod. Um, he uh, he steps up to this uh, with uh, with enthusiasm that the rest of us just stand back and admire. So so can I thank him for his leadership in this important area? And I know it's going to become more important as it enters into the legal framework. So thank you, Rod. Thank you very much, Leah. And I will echo that, Rod, because I know you've always been very good. You've supported me by attending the four or five flag racings we've had here, just socially distanced in rain and drizzle and everything except snow this year. And I'm very grateful for that. And you've always been a, a good sense of humor. You can take it on the chin, and long may it be so. I uh, am drawing to the close now. And I, before I uh, finish, I would like to particularly thank Laura Rose from our support team, who um, has made uh, this happen. She's been dashing around and connecting people up and disconnecting people and doing whatever uh, she does with her pliers in her hand over there. And uh, Ollie, also from the technical services, he again, is, he worked tirelessly. He was in here at half past seven this morning trying to uh, configure the rooms and wires, and it's a trail of wires all over the place. Thank you both for you two, because you're slightly the unsung heroes. And also it follows that Scott, um, as my monitoring officer, is a great help uh, to running the council. And the legal officer is, uh, uh, is, is goes without saying the advice. But none of this would work without you as councillors from each of the different parties that you all represent. I'm sad that we can't come together as one party. I long to be back in our council chamber where we can see and, and talk and debate and jest or Mickey take or see business done and serve our public, the people of Somerset. And whether you agree with it or whether you don't agree with our policies from one side or the other, it's essential we work as a united team for Somerset, for the people of Somerset. And that I'd like to thank you. I thank all of you that have attended today and all the members of the public that have tuned in, the press, etc. And uh, I'd like to wish you, and I hope this is uh, not going to be hollow, but I'd like to wish you a happy new year uh, and a cautious uh, Christmas period. Be safe and uh, follow the NHS advice. 
I, I wish, wish you well, and the, the next meeting of the County Council will be on Wednesday, the 17th of February, 2021. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Chair. Well done, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Goodbye. Thank you, Chair. Goodbye. Well said. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Happy New Year, Nigel. And to you too, John. <laughs>